Members of Congress testified before a House committee today on proposed changes to lobbying rules. Republicans and Democrats talked about transparency and stricter limits on receiving gifts. This is three and a half hours. Morning. The uh, Rules Committee will come to order. Uh, we are here this morning for consideration of uh, H.R. 4975, the Lobbying Accountability and Transparency Act 2006. Let me just say that uh, many hours of Rules Committee hearings and weeks of consultation with members, constituents, and outside uh, experts have resulted in the introduction of H.R. 4975, the Lobbying Accountability and Transparency Act 2006. At the very beginning of this process, uh, I said that, it would, uh, that we would look at every idea from any member, that we would forge a bipartisan solution to this bipartisan problem. And I should say parenthetically that I was listening to National Public Radio this morning and heard Senator Reid talk about the fact that he and Senator Frist are with great regularity fighting like cats and dogs, and yet they've been able to, in a bipartisan way, come to uh, a very, very good agreement, uh, they believe, in the, uh, in the Senate on this issue, and I hope very much that we will be able to do that. Uh, we have to do everything that we can to increase accountability, transparency, and disclosure, and I believe uh, very much that we can do that with bold reform. I think that we have achieved these goals with this legislation. H.R. 4975 enhances disclosure. It focuses on bright lines of right and wrong and it lays down clear consequences for crossing those lines. I want to express my appreciation to Speaker Hastert, uh, who uh, drafted me to work on this issue uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, we've been working with uh, Leader Boehner and other members of our leadership team to uh, fashion uh, this measure, which uh, has been co-sponsored by uh, nearly all the members of our leadership team. I, also would like to express my appreciation for the tremendous feedback that we've gotten from both Democrats and Republicans. I've been hearing from many of them, and, and the, uh, the great notion of cooperation that I've found is something that has been uh, very encouraging to me. We're in the final stretch of what has been, uh, as I said, a, a lengthy and bipartisan and open process. And as promised, the bill is moving through regular order. That's one of the things that Speaker Hastert said that he wanted to do. There are going to be five committees of jurisdiction involved in this, including this committee. Now, while I fully support the uh, goals and, and, uh, and all uh, set forth in this legislation, uh, this is uh, only my 26th year here, and I know that refinements are made as we proceed through the, um, through the process. But at the end of the day, I'm confident that the final legislation will receive strong bipartisan support. On an issue as important as lobbying and ethics reform, we will show the American people that we can cut through the rhetoric and work together for a, um, for a Congress that is beyond reproach, which I believe is something that is absolutely essential for us to continue to pursue. In this, the third Rules Committee hearing on lobbying reform, we've invited members to share their comments and suggestions on our legislation. And I want to uh, thank all of them. Uh, we've got a lengthy uh, list uh, today, and I want to thank all the members who are going to be participating on this. Before we begin, let me just say um, that this bill, um, the, we've, we've taken the approach, as I indicated, of the more information, the better, with virtually every provision, from lobbyist disclosure to the revolving door issue. And in addition to transparency, we have enhanced accountability and toughened the penalties for noncompliance. Let me briefly touch on a few of the highlights. H.R. 4975 fundamentally changes the process for earmarks. The bill requires the sponsor of an earmark to be named and allows points of order against individual earmarks on the floor. <clears throat> Bringing earmarks into the light of day will promote fiscal responsibility and more effective government spending. This reform will build on the excellent work already being done by the Appropriations Committee and uh, my California colleague, Chairman Jerry Lewis, 
where a new system for earmarks is showing results. And I should say I, I see uh, the ranking minority member of the Appropriations Committee here. Uh, an awful lot has been done. In fact, earmark requests are down 40 percent from last year, and I believe that's because of the, the leadership that has been shown by Mr. Lewis in, in uh, bringing about uh, already good, strong changes in the area of earmarks. This legislation takes a tough line on privately funded travel by banning it for the remainder of the 109th Congress. While getting out from under the Capitol Dome is critical to our jobs, and uh, I'm very proud of the congressional travel that I've been involved in. It's dramatically enhanced my ability to do this job. The current system, unfortunately, is ripe for abuse and clearly needs to be tightened. While an immediate ban, with an immediate ban, we are taking the issue off the table so that the Ethics Committee, chaired by our very distinguished colleague, Mr. Hastings and Mr. Cole serves on that committee as well. What we're doing with this legislation is, is we're calling on the Ethics Committee to have time to study alternatives and offer recommendations to us at this committee. As with this entire legislative package, we, I believe, are erring on the side of integrity, which is very important for us to do. Finally, members convicted of crimes related to their public service forfeit the government's contribution to their congressional pensions. Taxpayers should not be forced to subsidize the retirement of convicted criminals. H.R. 4975 is legislation every member can be proud of, both because of the process that has been used to write it and to the substance of the provisions that are included in this. This bill covers a lot of ground. It makes bold changes, and it upholds the traditions and the integrity of the Congress. Let me just say that I do look forward to continuing to work in a bipartisan way so that we can have the, the boldest, strongest reforms so that we can play a role in enhancing the um, degree of respect that the American people have for this institution. I know very well that it's difficult to do that, and Thomas Jefferson, as I often say, wanted the American people to have a healthy skepticism towards their elected representatives. We unfortunately have shifted, uh, as Tom Mann has said, to a corrosive cynicism. And it's my hope that with this legislation, and implementation of many of these provisions that we will be able to get back to that healthy skepticism uh, that uh, is important for us. Remember Will Rogers looked at a six-year-old boy one time and shook his finger in his face and said, now you make sure you study hard, young man, so you don't grow up to be a congressman. And uh, I know full well that that skepticism is, a, is actually a good thing for us. But having said that, I think it's important for us to do all that we can to recognize that this is the greatest deliberative body known to man, and we do need to do what we can to enhance the confidence level that the American people have in their elected representatives. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me ask unanimous consent to insert for the record statement by Congressman Rick Larson. Uh, without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairman Dreyer, for holding this third Rules Committee ethics hearing. I want to thank also our many uh, colleagues who joined us to offer their insights on what is one of the most central challenges uh, confronting us today. It is impossible to exaggerate the significance of what we are discussing. When we debate the state of ethics in the Congress, what we're really talking about is the very heart of our democracy. And today we are forced to ask ourselves whether this body has any real commitment left to the preservation of government by and for the people. The ethical crisis confronting us in this House is truly corrosive. It has become the subtext of every issue we face in Washington, and Americans are suffering as a result. Our founders knew that if an open democratic process prevailed here, the legislation that we authored would be responsive to the public good. But having served as ranking member on the committee for over a year, I have no choice but to state that rules have been broken, twisted, or simply ignored time and time again. The democratic process within the halls of Congress has been forgotten and replaced by the desire to see partisan legislation passed at all costs. Corrupted bills benefiting the few rather than the many have been the result. Similarly, our Congress now operates without any oversight of the ethical quality of its members, even though serious ethical violations have become commonplace here. Our Ethics Committee has gone the way of House rules. It has become expendable. We've also heard a great deal of late about the role of lobbyists in Washington. Defenders of this industry claim that because of the First Amendment, the practice is and always will be constitutionally protected. 
But what did our founders mean when they enshrined, quote, the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances, close quote. They certainly did not intend to condone a system in which private lobbying firms wielding vast sums of money spend their days shaping our nation's legislation and do so at a degree that the average citizen cannot even dream of. And even more importantly, our founders would never have imagined that this Congress would prove so eager to cater to these special interests. Lobbyists, after all, can only knock on the door. Members are the ones who have to open it. In the weeks and months ahead, we need to halt this body slide away from its most fundamental principles. We need to drain the swamp. But while we've heard much talk about reform-minded legislation, I have no choice but to question the commitment to producing real change. Democrats unveiled their Honest Leadership and Open Government Act in January. It has always included numerous provisions designed to open up our system, <clears throat> to make it more transparent and accountable, to guarantee that bills are dealt with in a fair, responsible, and democratic way. For example, we have proposed ensuring that conference reports are more closely examined before being voted on, preventing the multi-million dollar expenditures from being passed under suspension of rules, and guaranteeing that government contracts are issued to the most competent contractors, not just to the best connected. In their reform plans, my Republican colleagues haven't addressed any of these issues. My fellow Democrats and I on the Rules Committee have also authored broad rules reform packages that will protect and bring back the Democrat process in our House. There are no comparable Republican rules on the table. Members of the majority have insisted and focused almost exclusively on the need to change the way in which lobbyists relate to members of Congress. <clears throat> I would again remind them that lobbyists can only be as corrupt as members allow them to be. And even here, we have to question how tough the lobbying legislation really is. Not two weeks ago, an article in the Washington Post reported that faced with the new restrictions, lobbyists, and I quote, say they have already found scores of new ways to buy the attention of lawmakers, end quote. The article went on to say that they will now be working, quote, through fundraising, charitable activities, and industry-sponsored seminars to get their way. Will this really be the result of lobbying reform carried on by the House? <clears throat> will we do nothing more than shift the meetings of lobbyists and receptive legislators from one back room to another? I look forward to discussing rules reforms with the members of the House, and I'm also anxious to outline some of the future steps that we will take to restore ethical conduct to this body. For example, Congressman Baird will be here, and I know he'll want to detail the Stock Act that he and I have authored and sponsored. Our bill will close a gaping hole in the law, which allows members, staff, and so-called political intelligence firms to exploit sensitive non-public information in Congress to their benefit. In any company in America, that would be called insider trading. It should be the same here in Congress. I'm confident Representative Baird will explain to us why this legislation is so important. Mr. Chairman, the American people should not have to concern themselves as to the integrity of the office holders that they've elected. It should be a given. In fact, they shouldn't even consider that our government would ever be anything less than the most honest. And in this, that sense, this Congress has truly failed them. And we're here today to return to them what they are owed. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Slaughter. And continuing with our great spirit of bipartisanship uh, in pursuit of this uh, goal that we have, I'd like to call on our first witness, Mr. Shays. And uh, I understand that Mrs. Wilson uh, was looking to join him. And I don't see her here. Is she, uh, she going to be? Well, she's in a markup. OK, well, so you'll be uh, representing her interests, I'm sure, very, very well. So let me say that we'll certainly, uh, without objection, place uh, any prepared remarks that you have uh, in the record. And I appreciate the uh, opportunity that you and I have had to work together on uh, this issue, and uh, as well as many other issues. And 
I know you've long been committed to the issue of institutional reform and go back to really the uh, mid-1990s when we were working on this. So thank you very much, Mr. Shays. Thanks for being here and look forward to your thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the members. And, and I would have to say that if I was in the Senate, I'd need to speak in tongues on such a sensitive issue. But being a House member, I want to be very direct, uh, hopefully not offensive. And if I am offensive, um, I'm certainly not speaking for my colleague from New Mexico. Uh, it's been over a decade since my party took over the majority, and I feel like we've forgotten what got us here. Republicans were united by three common issues, enact tax relief, grow the economy, and reform Congress and the government at large. The House of Representatives, I might say, passed campaign finance reform, and um, it passed primarily with Democratic support uh, and minority of Republican support. But after it passed, a majority of Democrats chose to find loopholes in it, and a majority of Republicans who didn't vote for the bill uh, chose to conform to it. It was amazing to me that after the 2004 election, we considered repealing the rule requiring a Republican leader to step down if indicted. That was one of the issues that we ran on in 1994. Next, we proceeded to remove the members of our ethics committee who had voted to hold our former majority leader accountable for his actions. And then we proceeded, it, proceeded to make it even more difficult to initiate an ethics committee investigation by asking that there be bipartisan agreement to investigate. It's clear to me uh, that power does corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's because of what I just said that I plead with this committee to do more rather than less on reform. I would like this committee to consider three reforms, and there are others that you all have talked about. Create an office of public integrity to strengthen the ethics committee. Uh, provide uh, stronger lobby disclosure requirements beyond what uh, your legislation requires. And I would suggest that we enact an outright gift ban. To restore, restore public trust in Congress, it's essential we have a functioning ethics committee. I've never felt, as long as I've been here, that the Ethics Committee functions properly. And I don't believe it's the result of any one individual. I think the process is inherently flawed. Uh, the legislation we would propose would maintain the Ethics Committee as the final arbiter of whether ethical uh, violations have occurred. The legislation would allow the Office of Public Integrity to investigate non-frivolous complaints and present its findings to the Ethics Committee for adjudication. If the director of the office dismissed a complaint as frivolous, the person filing a complaint would be barred from filing any future complaints with the office and would be responsible for paying the office's costs associated with the complaint. Additionally, the results of the committee's work would be made public. To ensure there are adequate checks and balances, a two-thirds majority of the Ethics Committee can vote to stop an investigation at several points in the process, provided they do so by recorded vote and provide an explanation of their position. The office would have many duties in addition to investigating ethical complaints. It would be responsible for receiving lobby reports and monitoring reports to ensure the reports meet required criteria. The office would be able to provide both formal and informal guidance to members and staff on the permissibility of conduct under the House and Senate rules. The bottom line is you would have a full-time professional staff that would receive complaints, investigate complaints, you would have the Ethics Committee, the members of Congress, adjudicate, excuse me, judge uh, what the outcome should be. With regard to Lobbying Accountability and Transparency Act, Senator McCain and I introduced, and the first legislation I referred to was introduced by Congressman Meehan, a Democrat, and myself. Uh, Lobby Accountability and Transpar uh, Transparency Act was introduced by Senator McCain and myself to, include, to uh, increase disclosure of lobbyist activities, which I believe would greatly strengthen our process. I think your bill uh, has most of these provisions, and I do agree that sunshine tends to have a cleansing effect, and sunshine is what this bill would provide. The bill does one thing, though, that is not in your legislation, and I think it just cannot be ignored. You have to uh, require those who fly on uh, corporate jets to pay the full cost of that corporate jet. To do anything other than that is to provide a huge corporate benefit to one party or to the other or to one individual or the other. I tend to believe that in the House, our leaders utilize this 
uh, and in the Senate, a lot of senators utilize it. It's just simply wrong. It's simply wrong. You could say that the lobbyist doesn't have to be on, can't be on board, but someone is on board, and someone is advocating the position of the corporation that is flying our leaders or our senators around. And I truly believe that you need to uh, make sure that that legislation includes paying for the full cost. And finally, uh, not the first class cost, but the full cost of the charter. And finally, I would just say, you know, I just think it's simpler to get rid of gifts. I do think you just take your hats and you take your plaques and you take your books, you might take your scarves, you exempt them, just get rid of gifts. Now, why do I believe you need to do this in inclusion? I believe you need to do it because of the failures of the last few years. I believe we put ourselves in this mess. I believe you have to do it because uh, of the uh, admonishment of a, a leader of the House, a majority leader of the House, I believe three times, three times. I believe you have to do it because of, of Mr. Abramoff uh, and what is slimy about that and all that's going to follow. This is a continued story. This is, this is not, you know, we found all the bad. You are going to have some of your colleagues, in my judgment, indicted uh, because I believe Mr. Abramoff is going to nail them good. And then uh, finally, I would say, because of a colleague, uh, a, a war hero, um, a friend of ours who went bad, and that was Duke Cunningham. He became a crook. He became a traitor to this country. There's no other way to say it. I would conclude by saying to you, if we fail in Iraq, it won't be, be because our army didn't do its job or their military didn't do its job. It will be because the corruption in government Corruption brings down governments. Corruption is like being traitors. We need to end it. We need to make sure no one has any doubt that it exists in this Congress. And could I just add one little last word? I do believe this is the deliberative body. If you allow deliberation, if you allow debates on these amendments, Mr. Chairman, if you disagree, for instance, with uh, uh, the legislation that would say we would have um, an office of public integrity, let's just say that only one-third believes in it, or one-tenth. Give us the chance to debate it. Give us the opportunity to explain why we think it's important. That's being a deliberative body. I think we've lost our deliberation a long time ago, and I also think that's part of reform in this process. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Shays. Thank Certainly you appreciate your, uh, your uh, thoughts, and uh, you've offered many helpful recommendations, and uh, I will tell you that uh, I, I assure you that, uh, that your input and uh, your uh, conscientious effort to address uh, a number of these issues is uh, something that I have the highest respect for and I appreciate uh, very much and uh, I will assure you that we'll do all that we can to uh, to address the concerns um, that you have. Mrs. Capito. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shays, I want to compliment you. I've known you almost since we came in almost together. Uh, you have stood steadfast on these issues since the first day you got here. You are what I wished all congresspersons would be. Your ethics were fully formed before you got to Washington. Uh, I, uh, I couldn't agree with you more on what you said. One of the things we talk about the Public Integrity Act, the Office of Public Integrity, uh, we don't do anything at all, I'm prepared, at this point uh, to check on whether lobbyists actually comply with the law. Uh, nor there's apparently no penalty of any sort uh, to uh, uh, assess to someone, a lobbying group that does not file, uh, and, uh, and no monetary penalty for failure to uh, comply with our laws. If we don't do that part of lobbying reform bill, we've done nothing. Well, you've done very little. And uh, I would, there's been a lot of talk, as you know, about changing the ethics committee makeup to either retired federal judges or former members. and taking it away from the present members. How, does, how do you well, feel think, about that idea? I, I, I think that's an idea, but I don't think you have to if you give uh, the investigative process to professionals, full-time employees, mm -hmm. who just then present their case. I believe this. The way you protect someone, if you want to, is never to investigate. If you um, have a professional staff that does the investigation, then presents it to the Ethics Committee, I think you force an action. Because either they're going to have to reject the findings or accept them and then levy a punishment. They can't ignore it. 
the ethics committee worked that way to some extent, I, I believe, until... If you gave me my choice, let me just say this. You gave right. me my choice of doing uh, a professionals doing the investigative work and a Congress doing its work, uh, and, and that wasn't possible. The next thing I would suggest is that you bring outside professionals to do it, the whole thing, I, as you've suggested. Right. The scope of what's been done here is so staggering. I, I, uh, I want to submit for the record, as soon as I get it in my hands, the Washington Post article on Sunday about Mr. Buckham, uh, who skimmed off a charity. Uh, here it is. I can submit that now. And I'd also like to have Mr. Orenstein's comments yesterday from uh, Without objection, both being Thank you. I, the, the depth of this was so staggering to me. Of course, apparently they they, they prayed at all times. Uh, they were very religious people uh, who were skimming off the public. And uh, I, I, the, the creative minds uh, and the things that they were able to do without any notion, I suppose, of ever being caught or that any penalty would ever be paid is absolutely startling to me. I, I, uh, well, you make a strong case for why you need to do it. Well. I don't think any of us are going to be completely satisfied either until we know what the Justice Department is going to be doing here uh, as well. You, you mentioned that I think we, uh, we have this sword hanging over our head here. Uh, but uh, let me go back to where I started. I really support uh, you, what you've been saying, the things that you brought here this morning. I, would, I did want to ask you about earmarks, so how do you sure. stand on that issue? I, I think a member should have to stand by every earmark. They should be public. Um, you know, at one time, uh, members were criticized for not doing enough in their district, and now some are being criticized for doing too much. So <laughs> it's an interesting process. Yeah. I think the best way is to make sure that uh, earmarks are, are totally registered. I think the earmarks that cause people the most concern is not the ones that are most public for their district, but something that was inserted forcing a department uh, a, an agency to have to do something, spend money somewhere, use a particular contractor, mm -hmm. all of that should be public. All of that should be very available. Absolutely. And I, I'd so like the to say... General, yield just for a moment. Sure. I think those are the provisions that we have in the bill. Yeah. Uh, to get into and, doing and, exactly and I that. should, I should yeah, compliment... Uh, uh, there are many uh, virtuous parts of this legislation, and that is a very virtuous part. It's not something the Senate would like to do, because I think, frankly, we have uh, less of a problem in the House with this as we do with the Senate. There's, there's one other aspect here that, that we're not really discussing, but now it hangs very large over the, what we're doing here, and that is, you know, you brought up Duke Cunningham. Duke Cunningham could not have done what he did unless the Pentagon agreed. Now, there's something really seriously wrong here if they allow contracts uh, just to be handed out and sold like that without any uh, attempt, apparently, to either... Uh, say to some oversight group, look what Cunningham is doing over here. Uh, but that, you know what I'm saying? The fact is that uh, we, we not, we're not discussing what the federal agencies have done at all. I've, I've said many times, not just the Cunningham contract, but ever since I read that 80% of the Marines that died in Iraq could have lived with the proper armor, and knowing that some little company in Ohio got the contract for that armor and couldn't perform it, uh, I wish I had a way that I could trace the giving of that contract. Well, you know, I, I've been to Iraq 11 times. Let me just add a little bit uh, different flavor to it. The administration kept underestimating how many they needed. They, they kept underestimating uh, uh, what the enemy was, and therefore they didn't think they needed to extend it to everyone, and they kept having to adjust it. Had they known from day one that they wanted to get way over here, I think the administration would have handled it differently. That's not to disagree with a part of what you're saying, but part of it was also just total underestimating the enemy. Okay. Well, I think as we do this with lobbying and we try to clean up Congress, unless we clean up contracting as well, we, we really not done the full job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Shea. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Slaughter. Mr. Gingrich. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Shea, let me ask you a couple of questions. Sure. I, in regard to uh, the creation of the Office of Public Integrity, I want to I want to make sure I understand uh, what you have in mind. It would seem to me uh, that, that the Office of Public Integrity would do, uh, under your proposal, would pretty much do all of the discovery. Uh, and they basically could accept complaints, uh, ethical complaints, of uh, uh, a member by, brought by non-members. Uh, and then in the process of uh, finally make a, re a recommendation to the Ethics Committee 
for final adjudic adjudication. I, I think you would, if 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 I'm correct in, in what I what I read into this, that the ethics committee basically would just be uh, a, a jury, uh, and they would not do any of the discovery themselves. It seems to me that uh, I, they would be a judge um, controlling the process and then rendering a decision. Well, let me let me ask you one other question, and, and uh, I, I, I want to ask you if if you have an opinion on on why the ethics committee, which is a is a bipartisan, equal number of Democrats and Republicans, and co-chaired by by uh, uh, Representative Hastings, Representative Mollahan, uh, has been totally unable to function in the last uh, year uh, during this entire uh, 109th Congress. Do you have an opinion as to why they've been uh, unable to function? Uh, it, it would be an opinion. Uh, my opinion is that once Republicans did what we did. We gave the Democrats an opportunity to game the system and uh, just simply uh, let us uh, hoist us on our batard. We, uh, we blew it. Uh, and uh, then Democrats could just watch us uh, flounder. They could just refuse to cooperate. Uh, and, uh, and, but it, it ends up resting on our shoulder given what we did. I, I have tremendous uh, um, uh, affection for the members, the chairman of that committee and the ranking member. Uh, but in the end, uh, to me, it's, a, it's why I would be suggesting that you just have professionals do the investigating and then have the Ethics Committee do the adjudication. I think politics has been played on both sides of it. I felt, for instance, the uh, Newt Gingrich was forced to do a settlement because he used a course to disseminate information. I had all 40 tapes. I had a class write me saying how outrageous it was what Newt Dingers did. I sent them the entire tapes, and the class as a project listened to every one of the tapes. And when they were done, they wrote back and said, I don't know how Newt Gingrich was, uh, was fined and admonished, and, uh, but I know why he was. Finally, he could get no agreement out of the Ethics Committee one way or the other, so he just said, OK, I'll plea bargain. Uh, so that I can then get elected speaker next time around because there were some of us who weren't going to vote for him unless there was a decision. And uh, in the end, uh, I think he was hurt badly and unfairly. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank Mr. Shays for his uh, testimony. And I want to associate myself with, with uh, the words of uh, our ranking member, Mr. Slaughter. I agree with, with uh, most of uh, what you've said. Uh, and in particular, I, I want to highlight one thing you said that I think is incredibly important, especially as we debate this, and that is process. Um, if ever we need to be a deliberative body, it is on an issue like this. And, um, and while I appreciate the, uh, the chairman introducing his bill, uh, 4975, uh, the only sponsors of this bill are the Republican leadership. Um, there's no Democrats on here. Um, I don't see any of the names of the leading reformers on, on the Republican Party here on this either. Um, and quite frankly, I, I'm skeptical because skeptical uh, just by the co-sponsorship of this bill because uh, this leadership, I think, has presided over uh, a lot of the problems that we see right now. Um, but having said that, uh, and, and you know, the chairman said we're going to listen to all the m members of uh, uh, Congress who want to come and testify. And we're going to consider all your views. But the bill has been written. Um, this bill shouldn't have been written until after everybody uh, had a chance to test. I'm happy to yield to the gentleman. Yes, I have. I thank my friend for yielding, and uh, you know I don't want to get into uh, any kind of altercation here, other than to say that beginning in January, when we started this process, I had countless meetings with Democrats. I put a telephone call in and had a conversation with a ranking minority member of this committee. I talked with uh, what you describe as lead reformers. I will tell you, I consider myself a lead reformer in this institution. I'm very proud of having worked on the issue of institutional reform from the early 1990s through uh, the, um, the passage and implementation of many of the reforms we've had to continued introduction of this legislation. I suspect that my friend would be supportive of many of the provisions that we have in this bill, and I actually reached out and encouraged a number of Democrats to join in co-sponsorship. A number of Democrats wanted to co-sponsor this legislation, but I think we all know that unlike the Senate, this has come to become uh, clearly a very, very, very partisan issue which has uh, played a role in exacerbating the divisiveness that exists. And I thank my friend for yielding. Well, I, I appreciate the Chairman's comments. I guess we have a different definition of reform and reformer. 
uh, the bottom line is I, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I would have preferred that before a piece of legislation was introduced and worked its way through committee that we heard from everybody uh, and that it was truly bipartisan, that it was something that uh, your leadership and our leadership could agree on um, and could work its way through here. And I know it's difficult in this partisan climate, but uh, well, let me uh, just that, say that, that we that have five I... committees of jurisdiction that are in the midst right. of going through hearings and markup. This is the third hearing that we've held, as was pointed out by Mrs. Slaughter. And uh, we look forward to your input and recommendations as we proceed with consideration of this legislation. Yeah. Well, yeah, well I, I appreciate the chairman's comments, but I, but I go back to what I said about process. And, and again, I, I appreciate the reassurance from the chairman that you know, my views will be taken into consideration and other views will be taken into consideration. But quite frankly, um, my views are rarely taken into consideration on this committee. Uh, very rarely uh, do, um, do, do people on the minority side or people who have a difference of opinion from the leadership get an opportunity to offer their point of view in the form of an amendment. Um, and so while I appreciate in the, in the chairman's bill here that uh, you know, we, we want to shine more sun, sun. We want to put more sunshine on uh, on earmarks. Fine, I don't have any problem with people defending their earmarks. I don't think any anybody does. But you know, when when, when I think about all the problems with the legislation, um, that's not on the top of my list. You know, I'm worried about legislation that, that mysteriously uh, comes before this committee and nobody's read it, uh, where regular order is just kind of tossed aside, where members don't have an opportunity to, to actually read what's in a bill, and it's not just about about special earmarks, what about special tax breaks? What about liability protection for a, a particular industry uh, that never went through the committee process, that never uh, that never was debated, and all of a sudden we find out after the bill is passed that it appears? I mean, you know, will those things also, you know, be have, have, be, have, have somebody's name have to be attached to them so that we actually know who's responsible for that? Would the gentleman yeah, the I'm second? Happy, yeah. um, this is a good opportunity, if you feel that this has been the case, to turn that around. Because if we truly want to reform this place and we want deliberation, this is the, it would be almost an irony beyond explanation to say we want reform uh, in ethics, reform uh, in how we do things, and then not, for instance, if, for instance, if you're not in the legislation as a bipartisan sponsor of it, at least be given the opportunity to present your views on the floor. That would be a huge process of reform in itself that I think, Mr. Chairman, reflects itself to this legislation. Well, and I, and I uh, let me just say to the gentleman, I agree with you. And I, and I think I, what, I'm, what I would plead for now uh, as this thing, because this as it works its way through all these committees, is that before it goes to the floor, that there's an open rule um, or is, you know, or you know, giving everybody who has a, you know, who has an issue uh, or has a suggestion the opportunity to be able to present that on the floor. I mean, I, I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to end up coming, with, coming up with a bill that is going to be brought up under a very closed process and that a few people are going to decide, you know, what's allowed to be voted on and what's not allowed to be voted on and, um, and, you know. And the worst example of that would be if it became a suspension item where we right. could have no amendment, we just had to vote it up or down. That would be the outrage of outrages. Well, I, again, I appreciate the gentleman's uh, comments, and I, I, you know, and I hope that he has an opportunity to offer his bill and his ideas on the floor, and, um, and as well as others, too. I think it's important, and I, uh, as Mrs. Slaughter said, that I think there's a, there's a great deal of skepticism out there, um, and people are not, I don't think they believe that we have, we're capable of cleaning this place up, but uh, I think one way to change that perception is to make it as open a process as possible. So I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Governor. Mr. Sessions. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shage, I want to thank you for being here today. I am well aware that there's always uh, criticism uh, about processes and the way things work around here, but I think that one thing that's important that I think you alluded to that's most important is that when a person's reputation, not just piece of legislation, but reputation's involved, that we need to have a fair and open process, or at least a fair process, that each of the members have equal access to. Uh, and I wish we could get to a system, but no, we're not there, where it would be our word, where we could completely write down what we did. It would be our word that we would follow the law. We would sign off on that, and then it would be the 
as David Dreyer would say, the Ronald Reagan philosophy, trust but verify. And then it could then go to an, a, another uh, step. I have found that sometimes, and I say this with great respect, lots of times there's an investigation that may be on or about you that you don't even have any idea that's going on and you're not even given any information about. And so I hope that we would make the whole process better, not just part of it. And I think that your legislation goes a, a long way to that. <laughs> and I appreciate it very much. Uh, Thank you. Chris, you and I maybe politically don't disagree on a whole bunch of things, but I think you and I maintain one of the strongest relationships that I have here in Congress. Thank you. And I hope that, that perhaps uh, that model, whether it be for other people on this committee or not, just like the gentleman from Massachusetts just walked in, I probably share very little politically in common with Mr. Frank, but he and I have worked on several pieces of legislation that we've been successful on. And I think that that has to do with a lot of our philosophies about what we think about each other and the processes of this place to where, how we view each other as to whether we're corrupt or as to how we make how we get our work done around here. And I think that sometimes those lines get <coughs> blurred because you will see someone who passes a piece of legislation and automatically think, well, somebody, some special interest had something to do with it. And in fact, I think it had a lot to do with a commonality of ideas. So I hope that we take all this into account as we're talking about this today, not only our personal conduct and a personal relationship we have with other members, but also getting our work done, because I think that, that we're being judged in lots of ways that every decision was made was a special interest. And I just don't think that's exactly right. If I could just comment, it would be easier for me to, to explain to my constituents that when I happen to agree with a lobbyist, they know the process is fair in terms of debates. They know that the ethics committee is actually a, able to function, and all those other parts will make them feel comfortable. And it makes it easier for me to explain with confidence that they can be comfortable with what I'm doing. Yes, and I think that if we were to look at what Chairman Dreyer is attempting to do, we are attempting through this committee to put this back into a process where we're willing to take testimony from anybody, any member that chooses, listen to all the ideas, but I think there's one thing that David Dreyer really is. He's an institutionalist that cares about the system and how we deal with each other, and well, I think I, these hearings are good for that. Well, I would like to say that that is very true. We have worked for years, and he has been leading the charge. It would just say to, to the gentleman as chairman, the best way to just put an exclamation point on that is to have his rule as open as possible. And, and to debate this bill as you presented it uh, and amend it as the House chooses to, to me, would be the best way to, to have that emphasized. I thank the gentleman for thank his you. time today. I yield thank back, you. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Shays, my, my first chairman in the Congress. I was proud to serve as your vice chairman and, and learned an awful lot about. Well, well, you showed me up too often, Mr. Well, no, uh, no. Mr. Putnam. I. Everybody's kept asking, who is this vice chairman? He should be chairman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I dearly love the House. I mean, I love being on the Rules Committee because I think it's an, an institutional committee. I hate, that the, um, I hate that the terrible, indefensible behavior of a handful of folks on both sides of the aisle have um, caused people to lose faith and trust in this institution. And, and, I, and I hate the fact that the debate about the things that we need to do to address the most egregious abuses um, inevitably boils down to something that's destructive of, of the institution. And I know that, um, that you've been a, a leader on, on ethics and process reform at a variety of levels. Sometimes we've agreed, sometimes we haven't. And, uh, and I appreciate where you are on this. Did, I know that there are proposals out there that would involve a, a complete ban on all gifts. And I was curious, I, I believe in your earlier testimony you had said that you were supportive of that. I wanted to know if, yeah. if, if I understood that correctly. You know, I, I am because we dug ourselves in such a deep hole. And it is just very simple for people to understand in your constituents. No gifts 
I have so many constituents and say, Congressman or Chris, why do you need a gift? And, and there is no good answer. There is no good answer to that other than you don't want to offend someone. And I can remember someone gave me this wonderful briefcase and it, it, they put my initials on it and I wanted to take it. And my staff grabbed it from me. And like, and I said, well, initials on it. They said, boss, uh, this costs more than 50 bucks. It clearly did. So I thought, well, OK, well, at least let me buy it minus 50. And the rules didn't allow it. But the simpler thing was, and, the, and you know what? They understood. And they were, I, so I finally said no. So they had my initials on it. Someone's walking around with a briefcase with my initials. I don't think he's that disappointed. <laughs> and I think, frankly, I think they're kind of proud of the fact that members can't take gifts. I think, in the end, that's a good thing. Well, here, it, it's hard to argue with the, with the rhetorical position that a total ban makes the most sense. However, I was thinking through the, the gifts that I've received this week. It's quite a few. That's the point. Yet yesterday, I had a group of 4-Hers in my office. They were from all over Florida, including my district. I got a, a jar of homemade orange marmalade, a calendar from the University of Florida, which is the land-grant school, a lapel pin, 4-H clover, and a ball cap. Well, I don't know what homemade orange marmalade's worth. Ball cap's probably 10 or 12 bucks. The ballpoint pen's probably 50 cents. The pen's probably a buck. Whatever. It's not 50 bucks. It's clearly allowable within the law. Somebody made homemade orange marmalade that I would then have to say, I can't accept it. I got an old electric meter from the electrical contractors that they had pulled off of an old house, mounted to a board, and, and put a plaque on that said, in it, in appreciation to Congressman Putnam for support of the independent like electrical contract. Nice it's really a neat one. Has no use, looks good on the shelf. At, at the beginning of your testimony, I had to step out because my cattlemen are in town. Florida Cattlemen's <laughs> Association, including constituents, met with me, invited me to dinner, which I cannot, ex which for scheduling reasons I couldn't accept. But I can assure you they're not going to eat spaghetti. They're going to go find a steak somewhere in this town. And probably they're going to find a steak somewhere in this town that, if you ordered a salad with it, would not be under 50 bucks. And they left me a parting gift, which was beef jerky. Certified Angus beef steak strips. Compliments of the Florida Cattlemen's Association. Eat them to your alligators. So my point is not to mock the concept of a total gift ban, but to say it is a human reaction that coming to Washington is a big deal for anyone except those who are from Northern Virginia. <laughs> it's a big deal to load up on an airplane and go meet your congressman or to go meet your senator. And, and if you get an opportunity to actually meet with them instead of their staff, generally you want to bring something. Can I, can, can I respond uh, Just to a second. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I'm reminded of the, cons of the family who we got in, uh, we worked them into one of our capital tours at the last minute. We do this for as many people as we possibly can. There is no discrimination on who gets in. It's totally a function of numbers. And they sent us a pan of brownies. We routinely get brownies and pies and muffins and all kinds of things in the district office. They eat a lot better down there than we do in Washington. And, and my point is that there is no corrupting influence in beef jerky, in homemade brownies, or in orange marmalade, or in mouse pads, coffee mugs, and t-shirts, which are in abundance in, in, in the congressional realm. And, and what I tell my constituents is that somewhere between free rounds of golf at St. Andrews and criminalizing mouse pads, there has to be a middle reasonable ground. And, and while it is rhetorically easier to say, we will just ban everything, it is not, it, it is not practical and, and it is not in keeping with a, a strong democratic tradition in this country where there is res respect where it is due uh, for, a, for public servants and, and for a human reaction to do something nice for them when they 
I mean, you want us to be in a position of esteem where people want to say, this is my grandchild. Susie, this is your congressman. I mean, you, you want Congress to be in that kind of esteem, and you don't want to be, and so we have to earn that, yeah. and there are people who have diminished yeah. that. No, no, could I respond? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. You know, you are, in one case, making the, a, a great case of why I was so proud you were my vice chairman. You are extra, extraordinarily effective in making an argument, but I need to have you expand your view. We tell post, postmen they can't accept gifts. Why not? They drop off, they bring letters up to the front door, they're thoughtful and they're courteous. We tell them, we tell military people they can't accept gifts. We, we change tell, that. We tell the administration that they can't accept gifts. <coughs> we, tell, we tell a lot of people they can't accept gifts. And we do it for a reason. And we do it for a reason because it is simpler, frankly, to say no than to then decide where it is. And so I make the point to you that I'm not going to say it's a slippery slope, but think of the lesson you could have told your kids when they handed this. You could have said, you know, I know you're, you're doing this to be thoughtful and to, and, to, and to express your gratitude, but because I'm a legislator and we just want to make sure that we don't cross the line, we've, we've passed a law that just says we don't accept gifts. I don't think they'll have a hard time grasping that. I really don't. I think it's an education process. And I would make my final point to you. We wouldn't even be here if this Congress hadn't decided it was going to say, well, if you're indicted, you don't have to step down. I would like to suggest to you this Congress needs to be rescued. And people like me and others are fighting as hard as we can fight to say to our constituents, we aren't the corrupt place you think. So maybe in Florida, they get it. But back in Connecticut, they don't understand why we sacked the Ethics Committee why we punish three man members for doing their job. They don't understand that at all. I still don't. We have to undo that. And the simplest and best way is no gifts. And once people get used to it, just like postmen and others, they're not going to give them gifts. And I will just say this to you. I have literally wanted to give a postman a gift. And he says, I can't accept it. And I'm proud that he said that. And I'm, I, and I'm not embarrassed that I wanted to be nice to him. Well. I, I would just say you, you raise other points that are worthy of reforms, and there are abuses that need to be curbed, there are loopholes that need to be closed. But as we do this, my point is that we should move forward in a way that is responsible and, and more than reactionary, and in a way that uh, continues to bring credit on the House uh, without building walls that separate us from generosity and hospitality and graciousness that is embedded in the constituents that we are here most to serve uh, when we are, we, you, don't, you don't want to erect a barrier between you and your constituents as a reaction to uh, the breakdown in barriers that should have existed between gr greedy lobbyists and greedy members doing egregious things. Thank and I, and I'll rest there. Thank you. If you don't deal with meals with lobbyists, if you allow meals with lobbyists, if you allow members of Congress to fly on corporate jets and not have to pay the full cost, all the other reforms you do will be meaningless in my district because my district will still say, yes, lobbyists can be gracious, but they're buying you meals and they're buying access. So we got into this issue of hats. If you don't want to go down as far as I want to go down, I sure as hell hope you at least get that level of gifts. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shays. We appreciate you. your being here. Thank you for your thoughtful appreciate input. It. And I can assure you again that it certainly will be uh, taken into consideration as we proceed with our work. Next, we're going to hear from a panel consisting of Messrs. Obi, Frank, Price, and Allen. Gentlemen, please come forward. Without objection, any prepared statement that you all might have will appear in the record. Uh, in its entirety, and we uh, welcome any summary that you might like to uh, like to offer us, Mr. Obi.
Thank you. You sure you want to hear it? <laughs> okay. Uh, what I just gave you is the uh, working book uh, that I used when I went to an Aspen Institute conference in 1991, and uh, uh, I have, I have the, I do. Uh, the, and I also distributed to the committee the agenda for that conference. Uh, and I'll get to that uh, in a few moments when I get to my uh, discussion on travel. Let me say, Mr. Chairman, that I know you've got a tough job, so do the other chairmen who deal with this issue. I have been <coughs> dealing uh, with uh, congressional reform issues for over 30 years. And I know that it can be a very tough job. Uh, we are here, as has been said earlier, because uh, uh, Mr. Abramoff, Mr. Cunningham, and Mr. DeLay have all been involved in controversies which have focused attention uh, on the integrity of the House and its processes. And we can react in one or two ways. My good friend Archie the Cockroach uh, has observed once that uh, there's nothing more pitiful than a flock of politicians in full flight. And <clears throat> I think we may very well see that in evidence on this issue. Um, I, uh, I think we can react to this issue by beating up on each other, or we can react to it by coming together in a determination to protect the institution that we all love and try to find ways to uh, strengthen this institution by respecting each other and by finding ways to strengthen the rules so that each of us can meet our differing responsibilities in this place. <clears throat> and so I'm here today to ask the committee, as it deals with this reform issue, not to play trivial pursuit. Uh, I know the press and some members, as evidenced by the previous discussion, are concerned about whether the gift is a uh, limit should be $50 or zero. But with all due respect, we don't have a $50 problem. We've got a much bigger problem than that. I do not, I must confess, I do not stay awake nights worrying about whether a uh, former member should spend one year or two consulting after they leave here, before they can lobby their colleagues. And I don't really lose much sleep over what rules should govern what a lobbyist can buy a member uh, if he buys him a drink at a bar. Uh, I don't accept gifts, but that's immaterial. Um, uh, I do worry much more about the credibility of a house if a member can shepherd a major prescription drug bill through and then turn around and negotiate a multi-million dollar job with that, that same industry. Uh, I uh, don't worry about reputable foundations and religious organizations financing members' travel costs for retreats on important issues. As Mr. Putnam says, uh, uh, I do believe that we ought to be able to find some way to distinguish between that and members uh, going to St. Andrews for three rounds of golf with lobbyists. Um, and I do worry about the integrity of the process if powerful members routinely use corporate jets to travel around the country, or if lobbyists can establish insider uh, uh, relationships with members by going on golfing trips to Scotland or any place else. Um, I, uh, I gave you that booklet because I have participated since 1985 in conferences by the Aspen Institute. Bring back some great memories. And, and they have been tremendously bipartisan experiences, and I want to tell you one story to illustrate their value. Uh, we would not have, in my judgment, a free South Africa today if uh, members of Congress had not systematically learned what the issues were and what the pressure points were in Aspen conferences, which were sponsored many years ago on that subject. Um, the Nun Luger program, which tries to soak up nuclear weapons and nuclear technology uh, uh, around the world. Uh, 
we would not have that program if it had not been for the fact that in 1991 at this conference, uh, you had uh, 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 Mr. Kazarov, who was the Soviet foreign minister, and Mr. Kokoshin, who was the deputy defense minister at the time. Uh, if they hadn't sat down with us at that conference and told us that they were worried pea green about uh, Russian soldiers who weren't being paid and who had access to tactical nuclear weapons. And so they walked through with us their concerns and urged us, begged us to find some way to enable the West to take custody of that material before it fell into the wrong hands. And so you had people like Carl Levin and Dick Luger and, uh, and myself and Les Aspen and others who uh, uh, sat there, uh, listened to what we heard, came back home, and Jack Murtha and I were able to insert in the defense appropriation bill some bridge funding in order to start that program until Luger and Aspen and, and, and Nunn and others could get it passed in the authorization level. Uh, uh, I, I, I see no reason whatsoever why, uh, in our haste to clean up the uh, concerns about travel, that we would put the Aspen Institute out of business for a year and cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, which they will have to pay for conferences that don't take place if members uh, cannot continue to attend those uh, conferences. So I would urge the committee to focus on the big stuff, not the trivial stuff. It is a big thing when the Senate Majority Leader can demand that 40 pages of legislation insulating the pharmaceutical industry from lawsuits uh, be inserted into a conference report, 40 pages of legislation that the conferences never debated and never saw. It is a big thing when the Appropriations Conference can change the law defining organic food and unilaterally and anonymously place, an or place language in an Appropriations Conference report that represents a multi-million dollar gift to somebody inserted without a single moment's debate and without a vote of the conferees. Uh, earmarking. I think my record on earmarking is pretty clear. I resisted it strenuously uh, in, in, in the years uh, when uh, uh, we were in the majority. And I want to give you some numbers. And it's important for people to distinguish between uh, different subcommittees on earmarking. CRS tried for a year and a half to get a definition of earmarking. And they finally concluded that you had to have one, a different definition for virtually every subcommittee because of the different nature of those appropriations bills. Uh, there were four subcommittees, historically, who uh, routinely uh, had earmarks. Uh, they were energy and water, interior, transportation, and, uh, and uh, 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 post office uh, subcommittees. Uh, there were other subcommittees, Agriculture, CJ, DOD, and VA HUD, that often had earmarks. And then you had bills like Labor H, which never had them. Uh, if, you take, uh, if you take a look at the uh, uh, Transportation Authorization Bill, the T21, from a number of years ago, that bill had 1,850 earmarks, costing $9.4 billion. That was two and a half times the combined total of the previous 40 years of authorization earmarks. And last year, there were many times more in that authorization bill. The Appropriations uh, Subcommittee, which, which takes all the, uh, the heat, uh, the Appropriations Subcommittee, in 1994, when we were in control, had 322 earmarks. Uh, by, by fiscal 03, that had grown to 1,818. In DOD, if you take a look at the operation and maintenance account, there were only 33 earmarks in 94, the last year that we controlled. Uh, by 03, there were 232. In VA HUD, there were 265 earmarks in 94. There were 921 uh, uh, 10 years later. In Foreign Ops, when I chaired that subcommittee, in most years, we had no earmarks, none. And two years afterwards, uh, uh, we had uh, earmarks all over that bill. In fact, in one account, the Economic Support Fund, uh, the Senate Committee earmarked 102% of available funds. 
So that's how out of control it got. Uh, so uh, uh, in labor age, for 10 years, there were no earmarks in labor age. Over, over, uh, over a 15 year period, there were less than a dozen earmarks in labor age in total. Uh, by 2002, there were 1,200 earmarks costing a billion dollars. Uh, so I think the record on, on when and how earmarks expanded is pretty clear. Having said that, I am not a Percy Pureheart on this issue. I am a pragmatist, and I recognize that what's important is balance. And Speaker Haster is right when he points out that if you are a Republican member of Congress and you are in a Democratic state, and if you work as a Republican member of Congress to get a specific program funded, and then your Democratic governor passes out those projects back home, it's the governor making the decisions after the guy who did the heavy lifting is here in the Congress. And so if you don't have an earmarking capability, then, sorry, but if you've got a governor of the opposite party, you're on the outside looking in. So we have, we have to recognize what is important here is balance. What is important is, 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 is a proportion. Um, uh, so that's why I say uh, uh, I think we need to get earmarking under control. I think it is way out of control. But I want to point out some practicalities with respect to uh, earmarks. I'm much more worried about earmarks being used to blackmail members into voting for legislation that on the merits they would prefer to vote against, as has happened in this place. Uh, and uh, even though we are certainly occasionally embarrassed by an individual earmark, I think the real problem in this House is that the rules of the House of Representatives, which after all were based on procedures recommended by Thomas Jefferson, uh, those rules have developed and matured over 200 years, and I think they have been bent many times in order to enable powerful people in this institution to ramp through legislation in an arbitrary and often an anonymous uh, uh, fashion. Uh, and let me uh, uh, get back to the point of earmarks. Uh, the 2005 Highway Bill, this is the authorization bill, not the appropriation provided a record $24 billion for more than 5,000 earmarks in the authorization bill. That was seven times more than the $3.4 billion spent on earmarks in all of last year's Treasury Transportation Appropriation Bill, including all transportation projects, not just highway earmarks, and all HUD EDI earmarks. Um, and, I, I, and I must say, people are focusing on appropriations earmarks. What about uh, 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 the, the authorization committee and, and what about tax bills? The 2005 foreign sales benefits and uh, or the 2005 Foreign Sales uh, uh, Corporation Act was intended to deal with a $5 billion subsidy that was not compliant with World Trade Organization rules. But according to estimates of the Joint Tax Committee, the final product added another $6.4 billion for 24 special tax benefits for ceiling fan importers, for NASCAR track owners, for bow and arrow manufacturers, U.S. horse and dog racing establishments, fishing tackle box manufacturers, Hollywood studios that produced movies in the Delta region of eight named states, and several specific shopping mall developers. Where is the reform provision that will deal with those? I invite you to go back and take a look at the 1981 tax bill. When corporation after corporation came to me and said, this is a terrible tax bill, I said, why the hell don't you say something about it? Well, because we've got this transition rule tucked into this bill and we can't afford to raise a peep. And there were hundreds of those transition rules costing many billions of dollars. If you're going to deal with the tail on the dog, which is appropriations earmarks, for God's sake, deal with the much bigger problem of authorization earmarks and the earmarks that you have in tax bills. Otherwise, this whole exercise is just a diversion. Um, what I worry about 
instead of the small potato stuff we were talking about today, whether we're going to ban beef jerky or ban baseball caps or ban a, a drink at a bar, ban them all. I don't care. What I care about is if you take care of the big problems. And, it, and so what I worry about, Mr. Chairman, is when, if, is, is when this committee can, uh, sub, can create a substitute text for a committee-produced bill. Now, the committee, I think your committee should have a right to do that because you are in the majority. You have a right to try to push your agenda. And it's our job, if we disagree with that agenda, to question it. So you, you have a right to have an advantage in numbers on the committee. You've got a right to get your program to the floor. But if you decide on the basis of instructions from your party leadership that you are going to substitute text written by somebody else for the text written by the Committee of Jurisdiction, then at least people on that committee ought to have the ability to try to bring the bill back to the original committee form by offering that text. That is simply fair and balanced, if I can steal a term from Fox News. Um, reconciliation. I was here when Dick Bowling and Sam Irvin wrote that baby, uh, the Budget Act. Reconciliation was supposed to be used as a tool to, to decrease the deficit. Instead, it has been used to grease the skids for tax bills that grossly expand the deficit. Reconciliation should not be used as a tool except to reduce the deficit. We ought to change the rules to do that. Uh, and, uh, and then I also worry, if you're talking about the integrity of this place, I worry about uh, 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 the votes now being routinely held open for three hours or uh, an hour and a half. Jim Wright did that once and he was justifiably scalded for it, and he apologized later, and we did it once more to save Charlie Bennett's voting record, if I recall correctly. Uh, uh, it should not have happened in either case, but when that becomes routine, as it has today, and we, when people begin to laugh about it, I think we've got a serious problem. So, Mr. Chairman, I would urge you to take a look at the list of the 14 proposals that the four of us have uh, proposed, because what we tried to do is to focus on the big stuff. And uh, uh, that's why we tried to focus on protecting conference reports. I mean, there should not be any material in a conference report unless that conference has met and actually voted on the package before it, which contained everything that's going to be presented to the House. And for, I mean, we used to have that provision. The Senate used to be required to have numbered amendments so that every single change they made to an appropriation bill was a separate amendment. They adopted a new technique which enabled them to fold every single thing into a, a, in, into a conference report so members can never get a vote on any of that stuff. You ought to go back and make the Senate produce numbered amendments when they change House appropriation bills. And then you ought to make certain that if there are special provisions or earmarks in that bill, that the bill lays over for three days so people can see it. All this stuff about filing uh, who is responsible for what, I don't really worry about that so long as the committee knows. There is one thing I think we really need to do. If a member asks for an earmark, he ought to have to certify that he does not have a financial interest in that project. And if you want to know why, just take a look at page one of the Hill today. It will tell you all you need to know about how out of line some members have gotten in this place on that kind of practice. And you know, when, it, when, it, when it gets to travel, uh, as I've tried to illustrate with, with what, I, what I gave you, um, I don't want members traveling uh, with lobbyists. I don't want members traveling on corporate uh, air, aircraft without paying the full charter fare. But by God, I also don't want you to put something out of business like the Aspen Institute, which has, it, it I never knew Mr. Cole until I went to an Aspen Institute conference two months ago. I just thought he was another second term Republican who I didn't know very well. I didn't know very much about him. We spent five days 
discussing in depth the No Child Left Behind Act and other aspects of, uh, of, of uh, education. And I got to recognize that he was an incredibly talented, formidable human being with a subtle mind and a reasonable attitude and we established a, a friendships just as I did with Dick Luger and a number of other people who I never had a chance to work with without the Aspen Institute. I, I've just finished writing a book. I devote an entire chapter to how the United States national interest has been improved through the years because of what members learned at those Aspen Institute conferences. And it would be a reckless disregard of that if they were put out of business for the remainder of the year because they have to plan a year ahead. They've got a co another conference planned on, on um, uh, Islam in Turkey. They've got uh, other conferences planned. They've got a conference planned on China. Uh, if, if, if they have to cancel those and, and, if, and if, the, if this ban goes on through November, it means they can't even plan for their conferences for the following January and February. That's going to cost them five or six hundred thousand dollars. What foundation is going to contribute to them after they've lost that kind of money because of a capricious act of the Congress? Uh, the Senate was smart enough not to do that. And we, uh, there, as, you, as Mr. Putnam, uh, or Putnam, as you said, there ought to be some middle ground between going crazy and doing nothing. Now, I would hope we could find it. So I've talked far too long, but I want to end by just making one other point. Um, if we are going to deal with 527s, then let's go all the way and deal with campaign finance reform. Now, <coughs> Barney and I and several others have an admittedly radical proposal. It says that in general elections, not one dime of private money can be contributed by anybody. And it doesn't soak the taxpayer for it by increasing the deficit. It sets up a voluntary contribution system so that taxpayers themselves can take their country back by, by making elections what they're supposed to be, which are public events, not private events. You don't have to agree with that bill to allow us to vote on something like that. If, if, if you're going to deal with 527s, that's a selective act. If you're going to deal with campaign finance reform, then do it on a comprehensive basis so that everybody's ideas are on the table. And then lastly, in separating out the trivia, in separating, se separating out the diversions from, uh, from the real thing, I ask you to remember what Otis Pike said a long time ago. Otis was a class act uh, member of, the co of Congress from New York. And he said this. <coughs> he said, you can talk about ethics forever, and pass more rules and reveal yourselves until all of you and your spouses' finances, food, drink, sex, religion, clothing, vacations, and hours and minutes and places of your arising and retiring are all public records, but you will never be held in high regard or deemed ethical while you say you can't balance a budget unless a constitutional amendment makes you, while you accept gloriously optimistic economic projections rather than dealing with real ones, while you write a Graham Rudman bill and then spend days finding ways to get around it, and while you let one man make $550 million a year while thousands sleep in the streets. And I would hope that we would remember that as we deal uh, with these issues. Thank you very much, Mr. Obey. Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we're under time pressures, um, so I'll summarize my statement. I, I do want to commend you for um, the work you've done in this first year of the House Democracy Assistance Commission. It's been a pleasure to work with you. This has been a totally bipartisan effort. Seven countries already, partners at work with us, so thank you for your leadership in that regard. And thank you also for um, drafting this package reforms. I, the package of reforms, I think it, it does address some of the most blatant abuses that we've witnessed in this and recent Congresses. But I'm here today to offer um, modifications and amendments in, in two respects, in some ways to urge the committee to adopt an approach that is more discriminating, for example, with regard to congressional travel, and in other ways more comprehensive, for example, with regard to how the House is being run. We've got to think very carefully about this travel matter. It's a highly contentious issue. I know at first blush a one-year moratorium seems like a reasonable fallback position. 
But I hope we'll have no illusions that a one-year moratorium would be a painless way to kick this issue down the road while the Ethics Committee or somebody else develops uh, more permanent guidelines. A moratorium would mean, as Mr. Obi has stressed, a devastating loss to reputable nonprofit educational and religious foundations of hundreds of thousands of dollars already invested in upcoming conferences, as well as a lost opportunity for members to become better informed on important issues. I see no compelling reason why we shouldn't act now to establish rules for member travel. The legislation that the four of us has introduced has uh, some detailed provisions. I won't read them here. Let me just say, we worked on this for weeks. This held up our introduction of the package because we wanted to get it right. So I, I commend that language to you. I hope you'll take a good look at it because this is not something that we have to uh, go to one extreme or the other on. We don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can draw some bright lines that need to be drawn and at the same time protect, uh, protect the activities of le legitimate um, education and religious uh, foundations. Uh, to the stories that uh, Mr. Obie's uh, told about the Aspen Institute, I would add the Faith and Politics Institute. This wonderful pilgrimage to Selma, Montgomery, Birmingham, a moving experience. For some, I think a life-changing experience. Why on earth would we want to uh, prohibit that? Uh, it, it, it's one of the best things, the most wholesome and bipartisan things that goes on around here. Let's be very, very careful. And the one-year moratorium, despite its surface appeal, is not uh, a, a good answer. Um, my statement also uh, reiterates Mr. Obie's position on the, uh, on the use of private aircraft, so I won't uh, go into that here. Uh, <clears throat> finally, let me say, though, that I do hope the reform package uh, will uh, go to some of these issues about how the, the House is, is, is being governed so that we have a chance to read and understand what we're voting on, so that conferences are meeting and voting in an open and transparent way, uh, so that we have bipartisan content, consent if we have to hold a vote, a vote open for a prolonged period of time. I think uh, we, uh, and, and let me also stress, we're not just saying this as, as members looking for fairness for the minority. Of course, we're interested in fairness for the minority. But I would hope the spirit in which we take this on would be adopting the kind of rules that we're live, willing to live with in the majority or the minority that really enhance the effectiveness and legitimacy of this institution. And I, so, so in that spirit, I offer the, uh, the, the more um, discriminating provisions on, on travel and, and also uh, the suggestion that you move beyond what's in the bill now to this matter of uh, the governance of the House. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Price. Appreciate your, uh, your input. And uh, I will say that it is a pleasure to be working with you on our Democracy Assistance Commission. And I appreciate your comments in support of a number of the initiatives that we've included in the legislation, and, uh, and your thoughts are, uh, are very helpful. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will, uh, I will be brief, uh, since so much has been said before. I, I just wanted to make a, a few points. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the problem is not the lobbyists, per se. The, the problem is the amount of money in politics and how that is connected to the way the House is run. And that's why the rules of the House that govern our debate, that govern legislation uh, through, the, through its entire course, are of fundamental importance. I think that money in politics becomes increasingly effective if you're trying to get something through the legislature, or increasingly insidious if you're a member of the public, when legislative power is too much concentrated in the leadership of the majority party. And I've been here now 10 years, not as long as some of my colleagues, but I've watched the change over the number of years as the, as the debate on the floor becomes more restricted, as substitutes and amendments are, are less frequent. And I believe that bad process creates bad policy. And to some extent, I believe that even members of the majority come to expect coercion about votes as being normal uh, instead, of, uh, instead of something to be, to be changed. The key process reforms in our proposal are to prohibit consideration of bills unless members have had 24 hours to read them, apart from suspensions, to prevent holding votes o open for longer than 20 minutes except by consent of both parties, both leaders, 
allow a point of order if the text of a bill on the floor is different from that reported out of committee. Mr. Obi spoke to that. Protect against insertion of stealth provisions and conference reports that weren't approved by either the House or the Senate. And prohibit consideration of reconciliation packages that increase the size of the deficit. I believe it's critical for us in the House to include these measures because the Senate didn't. The Senate reforms don't go far enough because they don't touch these process, uh, these process issues. And I, we need to take the big picture over here and, and make sure that we're not only dealing with the kinds of gift issues that were discussed earlier, but also with how the House is run and to make sure that where, though the majority party needs to be able to get its agenda to the floor and have a debate on that, at some point there's way too much, uh, way too much restriction on members of the majority who are not in leadership and certainly on the minority as well. We need to put the people's voice back in the people's house and I, we believe the four of us, that this package of uh, rules reforms will help do that. Thank, uh, thank you very you. much, Mr. Allen. appreciate your, uh, your thoughts on this. Mr. McGovern. I want to thank you uh, both for your, your testimony. And, uh, Mr. Price, I agree with you on the travel um, issue. I mean, I think that we, we need to make sure that we don't uh, ban uh, travel that, quite frankly, I think by any measure is, 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 is viewed as positive and helpful to members. Uh, and I've been on the Faith and Politics trip. Uh, and retrace the steps of Martin Luther King, and I thought that was with, by the Faith and Politics Institute. And I thought that was an incredible experience, and, and Republicans and Democrats have been on that trip, and I think it's a very positive uh, and educational experience. Uh, but I think you both address a point that uh, you know I is, is kind of missing from from the draft legislation here, and, and I think is uh, is a very important point, and that is uh, that you know we talk about corruption, uh, you know we, we tend to focus on lobbyists, but we don't talk we don't talk very much about the process. And there is a corruption of the process here. Uh, when a prescription drug bill comes before this committee late at night and no one has a chance to read it, and it's rushed to the floor, and then the roll calls held open for several hours, uh, um, uh, you know, so, you know to, to try to twist arms to get votes, uh, and then we all find out what's in the bill, you know, weeks later as the press reports in great detail about, uh, about, the, about what was in the bill. I mean, that's a corruption of the process. I think any member of Congress who has gone back to their district uh, since that bill has passed, you know, has got an earful from senior citizens trying to figure out what the hell's going on with this Medicare Part D, uh, trying to trying to get an ex explanation as to why in the bill there was a provision that was written that says the federal government can't negotiate cheaper drugs on their behalf. I mean, it's it's people are stunned by what they what they what they're seeing in that bill, but. You know, I, I talk about corruption of the process because that didn't go through regular order. I mean, that whole thing was just kind of concocted up here. Uh, no one had a chance to read it, rushed to the floor. Um, you know, a lot of these terrible things that people talk about and that get highlighted in the newspapers could have been avoided or certainly could have had some light shine, shined on it had, in fact, we had the three days to look at a bill, um, had we followed the rules of the House. I mean, I, I joke all the time that the Rules Committee has become the Break the Rules Committee uh, because almost routinely, we come up here and waive all the rules, you know, basically so that we can rush something to the floor that no one knows what the hell is in it. And I'm going to tell you, that is, uh, you know, what, 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 what allows some of these special interests to get away with what they're getting away with, buying bills and, and, and getting these little tax provisions inserted with no one knowing, it, knowing about it. What allows that is the fact that e even, you know, reform-minded members don't even have an opportunity to, to see what, what is in the bill. So I, I think uh, any talk about... Uh, cleaning up this house has to take into account the process, which stinks. I, you know, it is, it, is, it is a process that, be, that has become closed. This is no longer a deliberative body. Um, and I have great respect for this institution. And it is frustrating, um, you know, to see bills come here without going through the, the committees of jurisdiction, to see members come up here with, with amendments, you know, Republicans and Democrats, and routinely be told no. You have to vote up or down. Um, that's not the way this place should, should be run. And I think if you want to restore our, our credibility in the eyes of the American people. I think we need to, you know, the old saying, physician, heal thyself. Let's, let's, let's figure out how to make this process work the way it's supposed to work. And, all, and I think you could do that not by instituting new, you know, I don't even think you have to institute new rules, you just have to follow the rules. Um, and so I appreciate, uh, you know, your testimony. And, uh, and I, again, I hope that when this thing comes to the floor, that it comes up under an open process, 
so that some of the issues that you talked about that are not addressed in this bill, we can have an opportunity to be able to uh, amend it. Anyone wants wish to respond? Well, all I would say is that uh, I think the public is very upset about what has happened with the Congress because of the pernicious actions of Mr. Cunningham and, and others. But I think they are at least as upset uh, simply about the way we treat each other. Uh, Dick Bowling, who was my mentor, uh, he was, the, in my view, the greatest member of the House who never became Speaker. And Dick used to say, the best thing that a majority a legislative majority can do is to see to it that it has a contented minority because they have much less incentive to try to upset the apple cart. And the way you do that is to try to respect the minority's rights. But in this case, in these changes that we're talking about that affect the conference report, we're trying to protect every member's right, majority and minority. There are a few people in this town who think they can wave a magic wand, the way Dan Flood used to say, and say, Madam Secretary, take a law. And uh, 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 the problem is that the average member needs the protection of time when the conference committees produce their legislation. The average member who doesn't have anything to do with this stuff being put in a bill, but they have to take just as much heat as the biggest uh, gorilla on the block, if it's something that turns out not, uh, not to be nice, uh, they need that time so that people can comb those bills and make certain that the product is defensible. And that's why you ought to go back to requiring a rule, uh, I mean require, requiring a practice under which you have to vote on the final package in the conference report with everybody present. What happens now, you get into a conference, you touch gloves once. It's a polite, uh, hello, how are you? Here's what we're going to do in conference. <coughs> conference meets for an hour. They comply with the technicalities of the rules, and then the conference never meets again. And a few well-connected people go into a corner and write the conference report. And they circulate the thing for signatures, and members never even get a chance to, uh, to see the final product. That's not legislative uh, process. That's not the greatest deliberative body in the world. I mean, uh, it's practices like that that, that, that uh, have made me say that when I came here, this place was 50% legislative and 50% political, and now it's 90% political. The gentleman, you do something to pull that needle back. To, to that most recent point, and and to your to your friend um, Dick Boland's observation that the uh, the greatest thing that the majority can do is have a contented minority. When he made that observation, by what margin was the Democratic Party the majority party? Well, by a larger margin than it is today. Like a hundred seats? Oh, you got to be kidding! I mean. For most of the time I was here, we, we uh, well, what did we lose when we lost? Uh, it was 53. It was, a hun 50 it was a 100 seat seats. swing. It was a 53 and, seat. And 40. So 40, 50 seats. Yeah, now, I mean, it's, now it's 15. So I would, I would inquire of the gentleman who's been around a lot, this process a lot longer than I have. But it, when, when, you, when you're that far down, is it easier, isn't it easier to have a contented minority who sees no hope for retaking the majority, who, 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 who is content no, to get whatever they can, can, can get? Fact, and and, and what, just a second, and using kind of a basketball analogy, if you're down by 40 points, you're not throwing near as many elbows as you are when you're down by six. I don't mind throwing elbows, but I do mind it when the rules are not adhered to. If the points of order are waived for the majority in consideration of a bill, those same points of order should be waived for the minority. I, I'm if not. not, it's unfair, and I don't care whether your margin is five votes or 50 votes, it's not right. And sooner or later, we've got to have practices around here that are not utilitarian, but are principled. If I may, on the gentleman's time. Sure. Uh, I, I'm not arguing <coughs> that rules should shift with the margins. I'm just saying, isn't it a fairly natural human reaction that as tight as this House is today, it is a more partisan place because 
because of the margins, because neither there is no dominant majority when you have a six-seat margin. But partisanship feeds more partisanship. I and the fact is that you've got the votes to accomplish what you want. This isn't a question of whether we're going to beat you. We aren't going to win the votes on the House floor. We know that. <coughs> That's why I said you have a right to pursue your program and you have a right to push it through the House, but we also have a right to register our dissents when we have them. All we're talking about is an I mean, when I offer an amendment in the Appropriations Committee to restore the funding for the arts, and it's adopted on a bipartisan basis, and then when I come up into this committee, and this committee strips my amendment out of the bill, and then allows a Republican to offer precisely the same amendment on the floor, so that uh, the Republicans get to take credit for something that, that they didn't engineer, Forget who gets the credit. That's an outrageous process. And when that's what this committee has done. If I may, on the gentleman's sure. time. When, you're, when your friend made the observation about the contented minority, was the rule in place that allowed the majority chairman to have a pocket full of proxies and vote for his entire committee? We never had proxies in appropriations committee. But, okay, what about the other committees? I have no idea. I, did, I, I didn't serve Well, surely, I mean, surely you know. I mean, you were, you were, you're an observant member. I mean, even though you're a dedicated appropriates member, surely you knew whether the rules allowed for proxy voting in the non-appropriations sure committees. Sure they did. Oh, so sure they, they, okay. They in, uh, uh, but, we, but we prided ourselves on the Appropriations Committee on not having proxies because we wanted members to be there doing their work rather than acting like the Senate. The Senate still has proxies. I detest Jim, proxies. It's not my time. I yield to the general lady. Uh, in the uh, late 80s, I chaired the group here called Organization Study and Review. Uh, it's the Democrat majority. And we outlawed proxy voting. The Democrats did it themselves before. Uh, but uh, you know, we recognized it was not a good practice, was not a fair practice, and that the least members could do would be come to their meetings and vote. But let me simply say, what, what, what happened last year, the year before, even 10 years ago, is irrelevant. Agreed. This institution is now in huge trouble. And there's only one way that we're going to credibly come out of it. And that's if we, despite our partisan differences, get together on a common set of solutions. And if people just go on with business as usual, <coughs> saying, well, we've got a small margin, so that justifies us going in a back room and deciding what the policy is going to be and to hell with you guys, then the public is going to see that, and you will pay the price. No, I, I appreciate uh, the, the, the exchange here. I, I would just say that uh, you know, I can appreciate the fact that there is a small margin here, and I can understand some of the uh, partisan tendencies as a result of that. But what is inexplicable to me and what is unjust and what is <coughs> what you can't justify are these practices of bringing hugely important pieces of legislation to this committee that have been totally rewritten and nobody's had a chance to read it, and then it's on the floor an hour later. Um, you know, I don't care whether you have a small majority or a big majority, I would think that even your members would want to read what's in the bill. Um, I bet if uh, more people had read that prescription drug bill, it would not have passed without significant amendment. Um, and this notion of having uh, conference committees that really aren't conference committees where things get inserted where nobody knows about it, you know, I, it, it, to me, it's, this is, I mean, there's, there's, there's no rational or good reason to, to do that unless you're trying to reward a few people or keep people in the dark about what's in the bill. Um, you can get your votes. Um, that's what you have WIP organizations for, and that's what you, you, you have your Republican meetings. But the look, fact of the matter is, the, the secretive way that this Congress is operating, the way members of both sides are being locked out, you know, every bill that comes before here is an emergency, and you can't get a good reason as to why we can't even follow the rules to have three days to look at the bill, to read the bill, to see what's in the bill. And, you'll and, if, I, and if I could add, one of the worst things, you talk about partisanship, one of the worst things that happened in terms of generating partisanship was when Newt Gingrich became speaker and eliminated the Democratic Study Group and other uh, independent groups around here. The Democratic Study Group uh, uh, produced the best research on the Hill on whatever bills came out of the committee. And, and the reason they were important is because they gave members of both caucuses 
information about those bills that was independent of the propaganda sheets that we each get from our leadership. And so members trusted the DSG. There were a huge number of Republicans who, who, who paid dues in order to get the DSG reports because they all wanted that independent information. Today, because the rules were changed to put DSG out of business, what do we have? We get our talking points from our leadership. You get your talking points from your leadership. Neither one of us gets the kind of detailed critical analysis we used to get. Uh, independent of the leadership and the committees. That's why, that's why the legislation was trusted more in those days, because the information that members got about them was primarily not from the leadership and not from the committee handling the bill on the floor. That's a massive change, which has centralized power in this place and made this place much more partisan than it used to be. Uh, gentlemen, yield as, as chairman of the Republican Policy Committee, I'll be happy to put you on my mailing list. <clears throat> I wouldn't trust the stuff coming out of your leadership <laughs> or my leadership if, if it's a partisan issue. I want independent information. We used to have that capacity. We don't anymore. And Newt recognized that knowledge was power and he wanted us to have none of it. I Mr. yield McGovern. back. Mr. Gov McGovern yields back. I would uh, just take a step back from this, what is a, an, an excellent exchange and remind everybody that what we are here to have this hearing on is those changes that, that are to be made. And, and after chairing three uh, unity dinners, uh, all of which encompass some form of, of reforms, earmark reform being one of them, one of the most common themes was if it's not born in the House or the Senate, it should not, it should certainly not be birthed with in the, the conference committee. And I, I, I'm with, certainly. With, with the gentleman yield just for. Of course. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. But, um, but again, as we're looking at this draft bill that, um, that you and the chairman have, have kind of have put forward here, uh, you know, you talk about um, shining some light on earmarks, but uh, as Mr. Obi pointed out in his uh, statement, I think, and I, and I try to point out in the beginning, that there's no accountability when it comes to, um, you know, tax breaks, or uh, we've had bills w when entire industries get liability protection and nobody quite knows who put it there, or why, you know, or, or who takes responsibility. I mean, none of those things are you know, were included in this. And it just seems to me that um, some of the most egregious abuses that we have seen have not been in the area of uh, earmarks. They've been in the area of tax breaks and, and uh, you know, protections of industries from liability. And, uh, and so I would, you know, I would just, again, is one of the reasons why I was a little bit disappointed that we, have, we, we, that we have a bill in advance of all this testimony is that there are ideas here that I think um, most of us could probably agree on should be included in here that are not. And, uh, and I'm not very confident that through the amendment process that some of these ideas are going to get included. So that's my, but, my concern. But, but let me caution the House, on, uh, 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 even on this issue. If you talk to Jerry Lewis, he'll agree with me on this. <clears throat> there was one good reason why often the Appropriations Committee did not put House earmarks in the bill until we got to conference. And that's because what the Senate, you have to put it together with what the Senate has done with their, uh, with their procedures. First, they moved to ha having all of their amendments in one motion. So that brought everything in the conference report. Uh, then what they did was to, they, 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 they would arrange their schedule so that the bill would be on the floor and as soon as it was off the floor, then they'd go to conference with the House. So if the House, we passed all of our bills by the, uh, by, by the July recess last year, all of the appropriation bills. So the House action held over all of August, all of September, and, and into the new year. The Senate would time their bills so that they'd produce their bill, and then we'd go to conference right away. That meant that the Senate got to look at House earmarks for months. The House got to look at Senate earmarks for about three days. And so that meant that they were at a great competitive advantage. So a lot of times, the House didn't put earmarks in, the, in original bills because they wanted to be on an even footing with the Senate in terms of the way that money was uh, d d divided up. Uh, and uh, 
The Senate also had an interesting game in the way they will add money to their earmarks uh, in, in conference. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, all I'm saying is these things are all very complicated, and if you're, if, if you're going to make changes, don't make changes that disadvantage the House vis-a-vis -vis the Senate. And uh, don't make changes that are trivial uh, while you're ignoring the even bigger problems, such as uh, the, the effective earmarking and authorization bills, and especially in tax bills. I appreciate the gentleman's illumination that this is all more complex than it seems and more difficult than a bumper sticker slogan. Mr. Gingry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I wanted to, to ask Mr. Obi his, his opinion in regard to uh, earmarks. Of course, there are a number of things that we're dealing with in this uh, uh, legislation. But uh, in, in regard to the earmark process and trying to reform that process, we've heard lots of testimony, uh, three different panels. And, and I guess this is the fourth hearing that we've had. Uh, and uh, the the I, I've heard it said by, by uh, many members uh, that they feel that uh, constitutionally uh, members of Congress uh, and, and individual members representing their, their constituency and knowing uh, uh, better maybe than, than the administration in certain circumstances in regard to uh, putting good earmarks uh, in, in, uh, and that is our our constitutional duty uh, uh, as members of Congress, and I would like to, to know what your opinion on that is, because that's, we're going back and forth on that debate about, well, do earmarks, is this the problem uh, that's, is this the reason why we're getting this deficit spending and this uh, eight and a half trillion dollars worth of national debt, uh, or, or do earmarks really have value and is what we're constitutionally charged to do? It depends on whether they are balanced and whether they are restrained. I would point out, we have this huge controversy over earmarks, uh, uh, transportation earmarks, primarily because of what the chairman of the authorizing committee did. The bridge to nowhere was not in an appropriation bill. It was in the authorization bill by a man who was collecting $1 billion in earmarks for his state. How many of you got a billion dollars for your state in that bill? I mean, that, I mean, let's put this in perspective. So the appropriate, poor Jerry Lewis is down there now trying to argue uh, to keep some flexibility in the earmarking process for appropriations, largely because of uh, uh, the hell that was raised by the bridge to nowhere that became a national cause celeb. Uh, so, so. When, when, when people get greedy or when they get outlandish and, 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 when, and when mostly when you don't have time, the problem with earmarks today is that they've grown to be so large and there's so many of them, it is an immense burden on the staff in order to try to make sure that those earmarks are defensible. <coughs> and uh, the other problem that I have like, as I said earlier, we never used to have any earmarks in Labor H. Now we've got thousands of them. It frustrates me to say that two years ago, I got only two calls from members asking me about program content in the Labor H bill. Only two calls asking me what happened to this education program or that education program. Every other call I got from both sides of the aisle was, how are my earmarks? And what that means is that the tail becomes the dog. And that means that members are turning the appropriations process into an ATM machine rather than having it be what it's supposed to be, which is a dignified way that Congress deals with the number one obligation we have, which is to pass a budget each year. So, it, I mean, if you're going to have earmarks, it requires restraint. It also requires that they not be used as internal blackmail by the leadership of either party or by the committees running the show. I mean, when I was chairman, I would, uh, for 10 years running foreign ops, I would love to have been able to use earmarks in order to, quote, discipline members. But I knew doggone well that that didn't, that that was not in the interest of the programs or this institution long term. 
And so, gentlemen, you don't let, let me. You can't have balance and restraint. Then you ought not to have any of them. R but you got it. But, but, but then it, it ought to include. Uh, the tax bills and the authorized yeah, re tax reclaiming tax my time and I don't I don't disagree with, with anything that the gentleman says I think uh, Mr. Obi is on target uh, in, in a lot of his remarks in, in, in regard to uh, uh, the need for earmark reform uh, and for members of course to 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 look at the overall policy uh, within a within a, a, a bill either authorizing or appropriating uh, and not just be narrowly focused on what they can get for their own district. But uh, I think that's what we do in this bill, and I think we're trying to strike a balance. And I will yield to the gentleman uh, from Florida on my time. I would just say uh, the, the proliferation of earmarks, if anything, in many ways has added transparency because they're published in the backs of those bills. And, I, and I'm not defending the rainforest, which was an appropriations issue, and I'm not defending the bridge to nowhere, which was not. And nor, nor the, the need to, to move these things into, uh, into authorizing committees beyond just appropes, as, as Mr. McGovern pointed out. But you need look no further than West Virginia to see that if non-appropriations committee members don't have a way to help their community college, to help their school district, to help their particular road needs, there is no way to do it without sure. being on the Appropriations Committee, which creates a caste system in the House of the haves and the have-nots. So earmarks with disclosure, with transparency, with, with the responsibility of, own, of ownership, I think is, is a healthy way for non-appropriations committee members of Congress to have a fraction of the say about how federal funds are spent as the Senator Byrds have had for decades. I don't deny that, but I would again remind you that the Transportation Authorization Bill this year had seven and a half times as many earmarks as the, uh, as the Appropriations Bill did. So keep in mind the problem is much larger in other committees than appropriations. And secondly, I would point out that uh, I don't care whether it's appropriations or authorization. When a chairman uses an earmark in order to break a member's arm and make him vote for a bill that he otherwise would not vote for on substantive grounds, that damages this institution. And, it, it, uh, it does, just as the process of, as has been done in the past, of voluntarily shifting earmark abilities away from safe seat members into vulnerable seat members. Absolutely. Absolutely, and that happens on both sides of the aisle, and b b which gets me back to my point. In the end, what counts is the way this place is run, and a large part of that is the way we treat each other and recognize each other's responsibilities. I'm perfectly willing to recognize your party's responsibility to get its program through. That's why I cooperate with Jerry Lewis on every procedural uh, effort that he's asked me to cooperate on. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't have the right to raise hell uh, by offering amendments if I think the committee is making a substantive mistake. I mean, you recognize my responsibilities. I'm perfectly willing to recognize yours. And that's what's been missing in this place the last few years. And now we're in trouble, and we need each other to get this job done right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was managing a rule with Mr. Bishop, and I couldn't get here. I um, obviously I wasn't here, but you're talking about earmark reform. And uh, when I came to the Congress, um, I heard that the Appropriations Committee is really the most bipartisan, almost one of the most bipartisan committees in the House, because you work together on you 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 tend to look at a project and any activity in a way that would not as Democrats or Republicans necessarily, but as members. And um, I feel very strongly that I think both sides of the aisle would like to see some sort of reform on the earmark process, because once it goes awry, as it seems to have done, it's difficult unless we do something to bring it back again. And um, you probably answered this question before, but I'm concerned and has it in the past, have we had more, do we have more instances now where 
where earmarks are put in at the last minute without any review, uh, without any checking in with the opposite, uh, with the opposite party. Um, is, have things been changed? I mean, I, I was under the impression that many times if a member from one party wants to put something in, you would check in with the other side. Is that something that has happened before and it's not happening today, or what's the process? Well, I mean, the answer to your question is yes, it happens far more often because there, there are far more earmarks than there used to be. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, but I, again, I. Every bill is different, and there are bills, the energy and water bill, by nature that is a project-oriented bill. It decides what dams are going to get built. It decides what, what uh, uh, locks are going to get fixed, um, and it decides what water projects are going to get uh, developed. Um, but then you get to academic earmarks. I detest the fact that today we have academic earmarks and that you have lobbyists hired by universities who will try to get individual earmarks for, for individual colleges. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's my responsibility to represent the colleges in my district, uh, not somebody else. But I can't change the world. We've gone past that a long time ago. So all we, try, all we can try to do is to be fair about it. and. Uh, you know, there, the, 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 on some committees, on some subcommittees, there is a lot of consult, consultation with the minority, and on other subcommittees, you have less of it. So it, it's a varying pattern. Uh, and my point is that if we're going to have earmarks, if we're going to defend the prerogative of members to have them, then we need to be together on what constitutes uh, a fair process. And that's why we have got to try, despite the fact that there are such temptations to have partisan Donnybrooks on this, we've got to find a way to try to be working with each other to deal with these institutional problems. I, be you know, I believe the earmarks are good. I mean, I think we work for our constituents. But I believe the process is what determines whether an earmark is acceptable or not. And I am perfectly willing to have anyone look at any earmark that I propose. And I think that is part of the problem, that there is not as much transparency as there should be. Um, I don't want to hand, hand this over to um, the administration to decide you know, what projects or what uh, grants are given. I really want to be able, because I know my district, to be able to uh, advocate on behalf of my district. But, process is important. It's boring, but it's important. And if you lay down a process that is open, transparent, and that we can stand behind any of our projects, I think that is the way to move forward. Well, I, I, I think you, you can use all the terms you want. Tra transparency, you know, transparency is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, to, to me, what's important is that the committee has enough time to review projects so that they can keep the House out of trouble if they see that this one is a turkey. And the second thing that's important is that we have time after the committee produces its product so that, so that members can review the bill and make sure that uh, they're not going to be embarrassed by something. So I, I mean, rather than all these fancy formulations, I think that the best answer is if you're going to have earmarks, whether it's a tax bill, an authorizing bill, or an appropriation bill, then have the bill lay over three days so that people ha have time to check it out to make sure that you don't have uh, an embarrassment in every closet. Um, Thank Madam you. Madam Chairman, if I could just add what perhaps is so obvious as not to need stating, but I'm going to state it anyway. And that is that uh, I don't care how much we write and rewrite the rules and improve our processes. At the end of the day, there's no total substitute for a sense of responsibility on the part of individual members. Right. And, and uh, Mrs. Matsui has uh, stressed that, that she's careful about what she offers. I, I'm careful about what I offer. I would, I would hope uh, any of us would be, not only because we don't want to be embarrassed, but because we are good stewards of the taxpayers' money. And, and, and not every proposal that comes in over the transom ought to be then transmitted by us to these, uh, to these 
committees. Uh, we should exercise discipline, restraint, ask some hard questions ourselves. And if, um, and I would hope that one thing that would come out of this process that we're engaged in now is that members would realize that um, for this House to regain the kind of stature and legitimacy that we all hope for, that it's going to require not just a new set of rules or endless rewriting of the rules, as important as that can be, but it's also going to require each of us to realize that we have responsibility to behave in a way that, uh, that we can defend. The gentleman to yield for one brief point? Yes. No, I, I want to say I agree with the gentleman. Um, it, it's, it's more than about rules. It's also about attitude. Yes. I mean, right now, under the rules of the House, we're supposed to have three days to look at a bill. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do. And routinely in this committee, it gets waived. Um, you know, it, it, all, a lot of these issues have been thought out uh, by people who have come long before us uh, to give members the opportunity to be able to review legislation, to find out if there's something that is horrible in there or something that has been snuck in. But, you know, this committee uh, has been used not as a tool to help advance the majority's agenda. I, I, I would argue it's been used as a weapon. Um, and it has, and consistently, uh, the rules that, uh, that, that have been written that benefit not only the mi minority, but the majority, the opportunity to be able to understand what, what the heck you're voting on. Um, you know, major pieces of legislation. Uh, the, the rules are routinely waived here. And so, um, so I, I, I think the point you made about the attitude and the desire by the people who are leading this House, you know, to actually believe that, in fact, it is an important thing for you to know what you're voting on for you to know what's in a bill, for the committees to have the opportunity to review what is in the bill. I mean, well, well, if you have a leadership that doesn't believe you should have that right, then you can have all the rules you want. They continue to waive them. I yield to the gentleman. And, you know, and I would just, one of my frustrations is that we've not been talking about earmarks for a long time. But I still would submit that by far the most damaging action taken this year was uh, let me explain what happened. In the defense bill, when the defense bill was in conference, we were asked to insert $7.5 billion in funding uh, for, for new flu vaccines to deal with uh, the, the uh, pandemic flu uh, possibilities. And when, when, the, uh, uh, when the bill was produced, there was only $3.5 billion in there. And so I asked, uh, the, the, I asked Senator Stevens, why? is the administration's full request not in this bill. He said, because we've decided that we're not going to deal with the question of indemnifying the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, and until we deal with that, we're not going to put in the long-term money. So we were told, I said, so that means we're not going to have language in here indemnifying the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Is that correct? That's correct. The conference ended. That was about 8 o'clock at night. Around midnight, the majority leader of the Senate marched over the Speaker's office and demanded that 40 pages of language be inserted in the bill that hadn't been approved by anybody. 40 pages of indemnification language, which purported to insulate the drug companies in case they made a mistake in developing a flu vaccine, but in fact it applied to virtually any any uh, product that the Secretary of HHS wanted it to apply to, and it applied to any device. Now, that is what I call an abuse of power, and that fundamentally corrupts the process. And if we're going to be talking about whether we like a little $100,000 earmark for an after-school center somewhere, or whether we we're happy with this 40 pages of uh, immaculate conception language, because I still don't know who wrote it. Uh, to me, it isn't even a close call in terms of what does the most damage to this institution. I thank you. I didn't get a chance to question, but I think you've uh, covered uh, quite a bit. I, my I sort of question for all of us, I think, is um, how do we get to that point that you want to get to and that I would like to get to in that we can sit down and not have the herd mentality of rushing to the toughest thing we can find and possibly damage the institution. And I hope that we can all try to work together in a rational manner. So I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate you taking stands that um, are different from some on both sides. And I think it, it adds a lot to the discussion. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. OK. Thanks. Thanks. 
Uh, I'd like to call up oh, the next. I do um, need. Me, I yes, gave sir. Dave that uh, book, the Aspen Institute book. I right. would like it back. I know we have several members here waiting to testify, so I'm going to call um, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Blumenauer, and Mr. Boyer, uh, and then we'll begin with Mr. Cardin. I'm the middle child. We'll start in the middle. Let me uh, ask that my full statement be placed in the record, including the amendment that I recommend to the committee and just give you a summary. By way of background, I served on the House Ethics Committee for over six years uh, during some of the most uh, highly visible uh, issues, including the House banking issue and the investigation of Speaker Gingrich. I was the uh, senior Democrat on that investigative subcommittee. And subsequent to the House taking action in regards to Speaker Gingrich, I co-chaired the uh, committee that presented the last comprehensive rules changes on ethics to the House of Representatives uh, with Mr. Livingston. And our recommendations were adopted except for one major provision that was recommended by our task force but was not adopted by the House. And that's the provision that I bring to you today. Our final rules changes, uh, and it's very important that we operate in a bipartisan process when we do rules changes to ethics, and it's very important that the Ethics Committee function. And the Ethics Committee has not been functioning in this Congress. And one of the problems that we have is there's three ways in which you can initiate an ethics investigation under the recommendations of our task force. One is that an individual member can file a complaint. The second is that the Ethics Committee itself can initiate a complaint. And in this Congress, neither has been functioning because of the partisan difficulties that we've had in this Congress. The third recommendation that we had was to allow outside groups to be able to initiate a complaint. And that is what I am recommending in our rules changes. I point out that the United States Senate permits outside groups to file ethics complaints. And I also point out that in the rules changes that were adopted as a result of our task force, there are procedures to deal with frivolous complaints, there are procedures to deal with expedited procedures to handle matters quickly, so that there is an opportunity within the Ethics Committee to deal with these issues promptly. But because we have denied outside groups access, I don't think our Ethics Committee has been able to function the way that we had anticipated that it would. And in, I would urge the committee to take this issue up and would urge you to approve the recommendation uh, for a third way in which matters can be brought to the Ethics Committee through outside organizations. Thank you. Um, we'll just continue. Chairman Booyer. Chairwoman, thank you very much for this opportunity to appear before the Rules Committee today to discuss the reform package under consideration. Put your mic on, Thanks. please. Thank you. This reform package has been fashioned to address some real and perceived problems with the operations of our institution. Some of the changes in this package are designed to address concerns about the designation of earmarks in various pieces of legislation. Other changes are designed to address relationships between professional lobbying community and members of Congress. I am here today to propose a change that is not contained in the current package, but one that I believe needs to be addressed to focus on the integrity of members of the House and the institution as a whole and the trust which is given to members to safeguard the interests of our country. As recently as last year, one of our members had access to the highest levels of classified material, that is, that the country possesses due to his seat on the House Intelligence Committee and the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. This very same member also was convicted of having taken bribes and steering millions of dollars in defense and intelligence contracts. As, a disgra as disgraceful as that is to our institution, what if the disgrace had also involved classified information? This possibility has bothered me, and I think it needs to be addressed. Therefore, I am proposing that members of Congress who want to serve on the House Intelligence Committee and the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee must first obtain a security clearance. I have since learned from security experts 
here in the House that if security clearances had been required, some of the financial irre irregularities of the mentioned member uh, would likely have been discovered. My proposal would be to amend the rules of the House to require any member who wants a seat on these, com uh, these committees to first obtain the security clearance, and it's very simple. These two committees have access to the most, clear, uh, most closely guarded secrets of, that the nation possesses. These committees are positioned to the highest level of trust, and I don't think that asking members to obtain the clearance in exchange for the privilege of serving on these committees is too much to ask to show unto the American people we take this trust seriously. I believe the burden should be placed upon the member to obtain that clearance. I also believe that the Sergeant of Arms Office can assist members with the necessary arrangements. There are entities inside and outside of government that work in this field that could assist the members. I've had discussions with, with uh, leadership, and, and uh, no one has said, see, this is a bad idea. I urge you to give this proposal con to consideration and to consider the seriousness of service relating to intelligence matters and to include my proposal in the lobbying reform package. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I welcome this discussion. I appreciate what the Rules Committee is doing, allowing people to come forward with ideas and having as a, a base bill. Uh, I would just offer up uh, a piece of legislation that my colleague Greg Walden and I have introduced based on our experience as state legislators in Oregon, um, uh, H.R. 4975. Um, I would make five brief points and submit written testimony for the record. First, our legislation calls into question just the role of members of Congress being able to serve credibly and effectively on an ethics commission. And our proposal would suggest that former members of Congress who are not lobbying uh, from both parties be a part of that um, and that uh, a uh, an even number selected, and they in turn would select another person to serve um, as an independent member, an odd number of people who know the institution, who respect the institution, who revere the institution, but frankly are not caught up in the day-to-day -day entanglements of being here. The awkwardness of passing judgment on somebody who sits next to you, who may well be a friend or an associate, uh, the fact that people really don't have enough time to do the pressing legislative duty, and most critically, is it really going to be critical, uh, credible with the general public if it looks like we're passing judgment on ourselves? We would suggest an independent commission of former members, independent professional staff, whose recommendations would be in turn submitted to the whole House for an up or down vote. The second point uh, deals uh, with uh, an issue that you've uh, been talking about here earlier. Uh, I agree with my colleague, uh, Mr. Cardin, that empowering outside groups to file complaints would be very important, whatever you come up with in the, at the end of the day. Uh, next, uh, I, am, I have some concerns about the way that the proposal that you have advanced now has been drafted, prohibiting um, uh, travel and activities with outside groups. Um, as I read the provision, it would eliminate things that are accepted as being valuable for the legislative process. The Aspen uh, organization provides what would be the gold standard, uh, financed by people who do not have any legislative interest. It is bipartisan and bicameral, and uh, I think pulling the plug on a program like that that provides a unique opportunity for us to, to work as legislators together in a policy context would be unfortunate. But the way it's drafted as I read it, it would also eliminate um, uh, work that I mean, uh, we've all been uh, invited to be speakers at conferences uh, hosted by academic institutions, speaking at commencements. Um, I think it's a pretty broad brush uh, for the last 20 years, I have accepted invitations from communities across the country to work in areas of my special expertise, livable communities, transportation. Um, I was in Columbus, Ohio at the invitation of the Ohio Association of Architects two weeks ago on my way back to work. Uh, I think cutting off 
access uh, to groups and organizations like that where we're involved with community development, people that don't have narrow legislative interests, I think in the end would deny those community groups access to important information. And I will tell you, having done one of these every, virtually every month for the last 20 years, I have learned a lot as a result of that. And I'm not certain you want a broad, to paint as broad a base. Um, uh, the final two points that I would offer up for your consideration is whatever you end up with concerning earmarks and legislative procedure, if you <coughs> simply required it to be transparent. In this day and age, the notion that there would be a provision that would find its way into law that we don't know the author, we don't know its parentage, I think is lamentable, inexcusable. Many of us in prior lives have supported <laughs> ethics reform that have fixed this at the state and local level. This would be inconceivable in my state. And that we permit it in Congress is beyond comprehension. And it invites abuse of the process, both the egregiously illegal and simply the slimy or the inappropriate. And I would respectfully request that you consider making sure, whatever you do, that it is transparent. Last but not least, um, I would hope that at some point as we're thinking about the role of and the credibility of, of uh, financial dealings of members of Congress, it may be time to consider just prohibiting members of Congress, once they get here, from investing in individual stocks and companies. I think there's enough ways for us to lose money with mutual funds um, that, uh, uh, frankly, this may actually be doing members of Congress a favor. Not only would it prevent the appearance of impropriety, not only would it make it hard to deal with insider trading, but frankly, I think, um, my, I strongly suspect we'd be better off with broad-based index mutual funds and leaving it to the experts and not having uh, any temptation for impropriety. Those are my recommendations. I appreciate your courtesy. Appreciate the gentleman. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Cardin. Uh, you mentioned that this, uh, that your um, initiative of allowing outside groups to um, initiate ethics complaints was voted down. And what what year was that? And what were the circumstances of that? And can you remember part of the argument at the time? If you could sort of enlighten me. It was 1997, I believe, was the year that we actually um, set up the um, task force as a result of the Speaker Gingrich investigation. We wanted a more open and nonpartisan operations of the Ethics Committee. We also wanted to give the committee greater power to move quicker on investigations and be able to dismiss investigations that were frivolous, but also be able to act more promptly on minor violations of the House rules. As part of that, we looked at the process and felt that it would be easier to just let non-members outside organizations be able to submit their information directly to the Ethics Committee uh, rather than put the burden on an individual member to have to identify uh, a, a member to file a complaint that's awkward and difficult and it's very difficult to get it done in a nonpartisan manner. So it was not terribly controversial in our task force. And when the matter came to the floor, uh, there was interest to remove that provision. Uh, it was contested. And there was a lopsided partisan vote on the House floor to remove uh, that provision from the, from the rules. Uh, uh, Chairman Livingston, uh, Co-Chairman Livingston and myself both believed that was the, the wrong, that we should allow the non-members to follow it. It was a very close vote on the floor, uh, but it uh, nevertheless uh, failed on the floor of the House in 1997. Uh, as you know, the Ethics Committee has had its problems. And we think one of the reasons it's had its problems is because that recommendation was not approved. And in looking at the vote, and I was just handed the vote here, I think it, 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 was, a, it was a fairly close vote, it looks yes. like. Um, and it was bipartisan on both sides. I guess it was the Mirtha Amendment that was the one that struck yes, the vote. I think if you look at the vote, turn, uh, if you could. I don't have it in See, front of me. Yeah. I think it was the overwhelming number of Democrats supported uh, the inclusion of non-members and the right. overwhelming majority of Republicans opposed it. OK, let me ask you this question. In terms of how that would work, I mean, you say it's already being done in the Senate side. Um, you know, I guess 
I'm not I'm not necessarily opposed or for it. I haven't really. Right. It's the first time I've heard you know it, it uh, the suggestion, and that's why this is great. We're having this hearing because we get to hear new ideas or other ideas that didn't work maybe before. Do you think that would be setting up for even more outside influence into the House? I mean, I, where we have certain pressure groups or lobby groups that want to, you know, say get a member and, and I don't know. I just throw that out. I served on the Ethics Committee for six and a half years. And I never noticed within the Ethics Committee itself any effort to make it partisan. We dealt with numerous complaints that have been brought to our attention, including outside groups. We dismissed numerous matters, and we gave members an opportunity to deal with public issues that were brought out by the press that had no merit, and we handled it very efficiently. So I think an ethics committee that functions properly is there to protect the integrity of the institution as well as the reputation of its members. And allowing it to vent matters that have received public attention that are brought to the Ethics Committee directly by non-members is important. Otherwise, a cloud remains. Mm -hmm. There are yeah. clouds over members' heads today because the Ethics Committee has not, not functioned properly. That's correct. Uh, lastly, uh, you know, there's been a lot of um, discussion and a lot of people have put forth, like Mr. Blumenauer's um, uh, suggestion of an independent commission. You seem to be advocating that the, if the Ethics Committee is given the tools that they can, uh, as is, it could uh, operate properly. Is that your belief? I believe that it can function if we allow it to, to operate independent of the partisan atmosphere and pressures of this institution. Uh, if we're not allowed to do that, ultimately, the Congress must judge its own members. That's the constitutional responsibility that we have. We're the only entity that can, in fact, implement any sanction against our member other than a criminal violation. So it ultimately has to be handled by us. All right. Uh, Chairman Booyer, let me ask you a question. Uh, you said in your statements that uh, if uh, the security clearance had been obtained that possibly uh, the um, criminal activities could have come to light. H how would that have happened? <coughs> I, uh, I've never had an opportunity to even privately or publicly thank him for his service on the Ethics Committee and what they had done. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to thank you because uh, in 2001, I am a member of Congress of whom had a um, politically motivated ethics complaint filed against him. And it was ugly. And it was because of my participation in the Florida recount that a member of the Florida delegation thought that he would take a political slap at me. And because of the expedited procedures that you had put together, that cloud could have, was removed immediately and it was thrown out on a unanimous vote. So I'm sitting next to you. I just want to let you know. <laughs> I want to thank you because what you did is you set procedures in place so that you try to remove this political taint and political motive. And you did a good job in doing that. So I wanted to thank you for it. The, the, uh, uh, when, earlier when I had said that the burden should be placed upon the member, it is a privilege of this House to serve on the Intelligence Committee. So if we want to serve, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you go to your leadership and you ask to serve on that committee. So what we're saying is because it's such a privilege of the House to do that and that all of us as members, we know of whom sits on the Intelligence Committee. And in my eyes, they are entrusted in even a higher stead because of the judgments that, that they're to make on behalf of a country when they operate in the dark world. And uh, um, if I want to serve on the ethics, or excuse me, on the intelligence committee, I should obtain my security clearance. That's that puts me in qualification. And then, it, then the judgment would be to either the uh, the speaker, or or uh, or Miss Pelosi in, the, in this case, she can make her judgment. It, can, it if it comes through and says, you know what, Steve, you, you don't qualify for security clearance. It really is the ultimate judgment would be upon the Speaker or Ms. Pelosi on whether or not to put me on there. Generally, if you can't get a security clearance, you're not going to serve. What I would recommend is, is, is starting into the next Congress, it would take two months to, for everybody who serves on the Intelligence Committee and Defense Approach to obtain their security clearances. They're also going to know where they want to get off the committee, right? 
If, they, if they've done anything in their past in their conduct or behavior that they themselves know that perhaps that they couldn't obtain a security clearance, they should know that they should not be sitting in that position. And then, then uh, uh, since they serve on that committee for eight years, after four years, it should be uh, reinstated. I'm a colonel in the Army Reserves. So continuous, continuous throughout my career of 26 years in the Army, upon every promotion, I, I go through security clearances. I'm a member of Congress, and I've, I've had to obtain my security clearances. I don't have any problems with this whatsoever. No, and I don't either, but the, my question was, how would this have shown uh, if, if the member in question had had to have a security clearance? What would it have shown? Financial misdealings? The financial irregularities okay. would have appeared right. because, of, because of the background check. All right, thank you. I'm going to next go to Mr. Dr. Gingrey for questions. Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, before I ask a, a question, I wanted to, uh, on behalf of our colleague from uh, Utah, Mr. Bishop, who is not with us right at the moment, wanted to ask unanimous consent to, uh, to submit a couple of letters, one to the speaker and one to the minority leader for the record, and I'd like to submit those uh, and ask unanimous consent to accept that. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, I, didn't, I don't have a question, actually, for uh, Chairman Bo uh, Booyah, but his, his uh, an amendment uh, is kind of a segue into a question that I did want to ask uh, Mr. Blumenauer and Mr. Cardin. Uh, in regard uh, to the Ethics Committee, uh, the first person that, that testified uh, today, uh, Mr. Shays, uh, had a similar uh, idea in regard to what I think you're, you're recommending, and that was uh, cr to create an independent office of public integrity. Uh, and, I, and I have some concerns about that, and I have some concerns in regard to uh, the sovereignty of this body. Uh, I mean, we are, we are the ones that are elected uh, to, uh, to the Congress, and uh, to have an outside uh, independent uh, public uh, Office of Public Integrity uh, uh, doing this, I guess basically w what we would refer to if I were an attorney of, of discovery. Uh, I, what, what I would uh, like to ask specifically though is do you think that uh, an outside commission or, or enforcement uh, entity's recommendations to the Ethics Committee when they get to that point, uh, th should that be made public? And if so, wouldn't, wouldn't that amount really to uh, trying members of this body uh, in, in the press. Uh, and I have some real concerns about that. And, and, and one other question I, I want to ask both of you uh, is, uh, the, and I asked Mr. Shays the same thing uh, when he was here, uh, do you have an opinion on, on why in the 109th Congress uh, the Ethics uh, Committee, uh, and really I think that there, the Ethics Committee, going, going back to uh, uh, Chairman Booyah's uh, comments in regard to intelligence and defense appropriations uh, is, is held in, in almost just as high an esteem because these are members on both sides of the aisle who uh, I would think their leadership uh, judges them to have, have uh, uh, a, a nonpartisan approach to things in general that are they're not strident, they're willing to listen very carefully. Uh, why is it, in your opinion, uh, in this 109th Congress that the Ethics Committee has been totally unable to function? Well, you've asked several questions. Let me uh, try to, to <coughs> deal with it. When I was on the Ethics Committee, we had the strong support of the leadership. Mr. Army and Mr. Gephardt told us to do what was right, and they gave us the support to get it done, and they encouraged us to work in a nonpartisan manner. So we had the support that we needed. Ultimately, you're correct. The decision on s conduct of a member must be judged by us collectively. Can even be judged by the Ethics Committee. Ultimately, it's going to be judged by the total membership. But we know that it would be awkward and inappropriate for the total membership to try to understand every complaint that's filed, so we use the Ethics Committee as our surrogate to give us the best advice possible. In this Congress, we got off to the wrong start. We made a cardinal mistake when we proposed rules changes through the Republicans' rules package without having it approved in a bipartisan manner. 
as every other rules package on the Ethics Committee has been done in the history of this body. That's why we had uh, Mr. Livingston and myself chair a task force to bring up rules changes so that it would be done, and the membership of that committee was equally no equal numbered. That's important, and it was a major mistake to try to get rules changes with ethics done by one party. Whether it's correct or wrong or, uh, or incorrect, it was the wrong process to use. Now, whether you allow the Ethics Committee to function as it should or you set up an outside group of former members, uh, either one is fine as long as it can function. The problem in this Congress, we haven't had a functioning Ethics Committee. We need to have a functioning investigative body that can clear a member of wrongdoing when they're frivolous or take care of minor issues promptly so it doesn't hang around the member and affect his or her credibility and can take up serious issues and report back to the full body for action. You need to be able to get that done. It can be an ethics committee made up of its own members. It can be one made up of former members, but it has to be able to function and ultimately the full body must have the confidence of that entity. Let me remind you that on Speaker Gingrich's investigation, as highly visible as that was, and as you know, we had a near unanimous recommendation from our ethics committee on that matter. It was still contentious on the floor. Ultimately, we got a strong vote of the full membership. And it was handled, I think, in the appropriate manner. So you have to have the confidence of the body, but don't expect the full body to embrace a process that ultimately is going to ask them to act on the conduct of its own members. If I may elaborate briefly, I, I agree with Mr. Cardin's point about having gotten off on the wrong foot in a, in a very charged uh, environment. But I think there is a hard question to be asked about areas that we are uniquely qualified to do ourselves. We can't hand off the responsibility for sanctioning official misconduct. That is a constitutional responsibility that we have. Any more than we can hand off the constitutional um, and, uh, and institutional responsibility to deal with closing of unnecessary military bases. But we have concluded, and I believe it was Mr. Army who led the charge, that we needed to have an independent mechanism because institutionally that was awkward and not likely to produce desirable results. And I think history has proven that that was the only way that we could deal with it, by insulating individual members with the log rolling. And I think that the analogy applies, that by having independent staff, by having independent members who vet, screen, and move this forward, that it'll have more credibility and permit us to move forward. Um, look at what happened with the independent 9-11 commission. I think most Americans would step back and say, they did us a service. And it was, for instance, an, a former member, Mr. Hamilton, uh, who actually, I think, added credibility to it. Things came forward, some of which we've adopted, some of which we haven't. But I think that model bears looking at when we deal with something that can be highly charged, that can go south, can, can be political, and more important than that, for the integrity of the institution, we want it to have credibility with the general public. And I think there are mechanisms we can do that will help accomplish that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McGovern, for question? Yeah, just briefly, first of all, thank you, and I appreciate your efforts to try to strengthen the Ethics Committee and, uh, uh, and to uh, provide more accountability here. I, I just have a question for Mr. Bouyer about his provision, uh, kind of follow-up uh, to what our Acting Chair was, uh, was saying earlier. I mean, if... Uh, you know, we have rules already that, uh, that we have to take an oath that we're not going to violate, uh, uh, you know, our, uh, we're not going to leak classified information. But if, if you were to do a security clearance on somebody, um, the, the, the information goes to who? It goes to the speaker? And to the, is that how you, you would envision it? Well, I, think, I think that information needs to be um, very, very safeguarded. Right. Matter of, um, so but if let's say if I were... Right. If I wanted to serve on the uh, Intelligence Committee, right. I would then uh, contact the Sergeant of Arms, right. who would give me the necessary paperwork, right. that I'd fill out all the information, right. and it triggers the investigation. Right. It then comes back with a recommendation. 
the, the I will, I, the, it, then the list could actually go to the speaker. In other words, Booyer, uh, either he's uh, passed a security clearance or there are concerns. The information is still safeguarded with the investigative body. If the speaker wanted to then look at that information, he could look at that information if he wants. But, but in the case it of Mr. is safeguarded. But let's, you, you mentioned the case of Mr. Cunningham, and uh, this was a way to kind of get at that kind of behavior. Let's, let's say the security clearance found out that there were, you know, some financial irregularities. Um, they make a recommendation, no. He could be yeah, well, you know, so, you, so he can't he can't serve on the on, on the um, on the intelligence committee. Um, does what triggers what triggers an investigation into criminal activity? I mean, how do you? I mean, you, you know, if you if we you mentioned before that this was a way for us to find out about some of the, Mr. Cunningham's wrongdoings if we went through this process. How how does that happen? You know, I. I'm looking back at my own experience, even in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I can't even remember a case whereby someone that had, was an attempting to obtain a security clearance and criminal behavior was discovered, who was it then handed off to? Was it handed off to the U.S. Attorney's Office for prosecution? Or I'm sure there's a, there's a duty here to act, I, but I, I, yeah. I, okay. I, can't, I can't answer. That's a great question. Yeah. I don't have personal experience. I don't have the knowledge to answer right. your question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Slaughter? Do you have any questions I, for our I'm panel? I'm sorry, I, I missed the whole panel. Let me apologize to you. I we have business from the district, so I'm not going to ask questions, but uh, I know what you said was enlightening and incredibly <laughs> and deserves all the attention we can get. I'll give you the clip notes. Thank you. I want to thank you, gentlemen, uh, for bringing your ideas forward. Our next panel will be Mr. Kirk, Mr. Meehan, and Mr. Doggett. Keeping with my habit of being the middle child, I'll start with Mr. Meehan. He's in the middle. Thank you very much. Uh, before I uh, give the testimony on, uh, on lobby reform, I, I did want to mention uh, to the committee that the federal, uh, the federal District Court has ruled uh, today on the 527 uh, uh, law that the FEC, or the rule that the FEC promulgated. Uh, Congressman Chase and I had filed suit against the Federal Election Commission, uh, basically contending that the uh, commission made a mistake in not ruling uh, that uh, 527s ought to register as political committees. Um, I think it's important because obviously it, there's been some talk that 527 legislation would be tied to lobby reform, and also some talk that a bill would come up next week. Uh, it's clear from the court's decision that the FEC now has to go back and make a decision based on uh, the court's decision, and um, my guess would be that it probably would be a good idea to wait and see what the FEC does on that. But I just wanted to mention that because I think it's uh, appropriate. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Um, obviously, uh, members of this committee know that uh, there's an ethic cloud raising that is above the uh, Congress right now, hanging over Congress. It's one of the major reasons why Americans have lost confidence and in, in one of the reasons why Ameri the Congress's approval rating is at an all-time uh, low. The relationship between Congress and K Street has gotten too cozy. Uh, Congressman Rahm Emanuel and I have uh, filed a piece of legislation. I know I had an opportunity to meet with uh, uh, Chairman Dreyer, uh, and I know that he has said that he supports a number of provisions in um, in uh, Congressman Manuel in my uh, bill. Basically, uh, uh, what we try to do is provide some accountability to slow down the revolving door between K Street and Congress, uh, increase lobbying and grassroots disclosure. Um, I think there's been enough uh, testimony relative to re the revolving door. Um, our bill would uh, have it go from a one-year waiting period uh, to a two-year waiting period. and. Um, uh, the, United, the Senate uh, has approved something similar. There's been discussion about an Office of uh, Public Integrity, and I know Congressman Shea has testified earlier. Um, I believe the lobbying reform package should include a, a new Office of Public Integrity. Um, partisanship has basically rendered the Committee on Ethics ineffective, and the ethics process has become broken. 
Um, the office would be comprised of a professional staff, but they would only investigate non-frivolous complaints of potential ethics violations. In other words, it would be a mechanism in place that before professional staff even got an ethics complaint would have to be determined to be a non-frivolous uh, complaint. The office would also provide formal and informal guidance to members and their staff. Finally, the office would provide guidance to registered lobbyists as well. It's also important to point out that um, to ensure that there are adequate checks and balances, the Ethics Committee and only the Ethics Committee uh, would have the opportunity to vote to stop investigations at any point in time in the process. And under this proposal, the Office of Public Integrity would investigate and present cases, but it would only be the committee, the Ethics Committee that would uh, make the final decision on whether a violation had occurred. Finally, uh, the lobbying reform, I think, also needs to include increased disclosure requirements for grassroots uh, lobbying, paid advertising, phone banks, and other paid efforts to stimulate this grassroots activity and influence public policy are now as widespread as direct lobbying. The public deserves the same kind of transparency with both types of lobbying. Under the current law, there's no disclosure of paid efforts to influence Congress through this grassroots lobbying. The funding of grassroots lobbying by Jack Abramoff and his associate, Michael Scanlon, uh, took place outside the disclosure requirements of the Lobby Disclosure Act. Uh, so we should require professional grassroots lobbying firms to register if they're retained by clients uh, to engage in grassroots lobbying uh, campaigns, and they should have to file reports uh, disclosing the income that they receive relating to those pays grassroots campaigns and the amount that they spent on advertising. Finally, the reporting requirement should only apply to large firms, that is, uh, firms that receive more than $25,000 in a quarter for grassroots uh, lobbying. Uh, with that, th that's a brief summary, I think. I've, I've, I've submitted uh, uh, more formal uh, testimony and um, uh, pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. I'd like to thank the gentleman. Before we go to the next gentleman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit statements uh, for the record from Mr. Walden, Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Rogers of Michigan, Mr. Wolf, and Mr. Bass. Without objection, um, Mr. Doggett. Thank you so much, and uh, I would ask, of course, to incorporate my written statement to the committee. Majority Leader Boehner has described the disclosure of relationships as a key ingredient for lobby reform. And Chairman Dreyer, of course, has entitled his legislation on this subject the Lobby Accountability and Transparency Act. I'm here today to testify about one narrow issue of disclosure that has not been the subject of previous testimony, I believe, uh, in this committee. But it is a very needed reform, and without addressing this narrow issue, there is a gaping hole that will continue in our lobby laws that will subvert the kind of disclosure, the kind of transparency, the public's right to know, that leaders on both sides of the aisle have said quite correctly is essential to reform. Uh, subverting the existing lobby disclosure requirements is really quite simple. All that a lobbyist who wants to hide who the true party in interest is, who's paying the high lobbying bill needs to do to hide the folks that, uh, that he or she represents is to form something called a coalition. A uh, coalition can be two or more entities or two or more persons. You select some nice sounding name for it, uh, a vague name of course, and then you report that the coalition is your sole client without identifying who's really paying the bill. Now it's true that when lobbyists come to see us, they normally want us to know who is paying the bill, uh, particularly if it's someone from our district. But with coalitions, you can, the lobbyists can have it both ways. If he comes to see you or me and there's someone from our district who has a big stake in what's under consideration, they can tell us who that is. But for the public, all the public knows is that the Coalition for Good Deeds is out there supporting this cause and paying for the tab and they ever find out who really is behind the scenes. This is not uh, an esoteric subject. Uh, during the last uh, five years, there have been over 700 such coalitions legally formed under our lobbying laws. And for over half of those, there is absolutely no membership information on the lobby disclosure form. Uh, if you do a little detective work, uh, search the internet, comb through newspaper articles, uh, as uh, I've done and asked the Congressional Research Service to do, we, were managed, we managed to uncover about one in six 
of these and find out who their membership was. And I think we came up with a little more than a fourth uh, additionally uh, where we got partial memberships. But for the vast majority of these coalitions, uh, who is involved is a total mystery, uh, except to those who are paying the bill and those who are gaining influence here in the Congress. By using uh, this existing loophole in our laws, stealth coalitions can lobby on a controversial issue, avoid reporting who's paying the bill, and protect the identity of the person who really stands to gain for, for, on the lobbying from us as lawmakers, from the public, and from their shareholders if they're a publicly held co uh, corporation. Let me give you just one example. The Section 877 Coalition, which eventually drew the attention of an investigative reporter and a front page story in the New York Times. It's a great example of this egregious loophole and what happens under it. That coalition spent about a million dollars seeking to prevent this Congress from tightening tax laws on wealthy individuals who renounced their U.S. citizenship in order to dodge taxes. And after considerable outside investigation, we determined that this coalition was really a wealthy family uh, that had moved officially offshore uh, in order to dodge taxes. Another example is the so-called Council for Energy Independence, uh, which has never lobbied for energy independence. They've just got a good sounding name. But they've spent about two and a half million dollars lobbying this Congress to preserve nine billion dollars in tax credits. Even the supporters of these credits have never claimed that they've generated any energy independence, that they've generated any new source of energy, or that they've generated any cleaner energy, but they sure have been good at tax paying time. Uh, earlier this month, one commentator in tax notes described this as the worst tax credit ever, one of the worst tax loopholes on the books. But you cannot determine who the Council on Energy Independence is because that's listed as the client of the lobbyist who's, where they spent two and a half million dollars. I have introduced H.R. 1302 for in the, here in the Second Congress called the Stealth Lobbyist Disclosure Act. And I would just urge you to incorporate it into any broader lobby registration, lobby reform legislation. It simply amends the definition of client so you can no longer get by with just listing the coalition as a client. Uh, it exempts those who contribute less than $1,000 for six months, it exempts 501c uh, tax exempt organizations. I'm not trying to get the membership list of the, of the NRA or the Christian Coalition or the Sierra Club or any other group. Uh, this particular measure, uh, 1302, is uh, co-sponsored by a number of members, including Ranking Member Slaughter, uh, Mr. McGovern. It has been incorporated by Mr. Meehan in the legislation that he just des described as one component. It has been incorporated by Leader Pelosi in her uh, Honest Leadership and Open Government Act. And I believe, as if as has been indicated uh, by the Republican leadership, there is a desire for a bipartisan process here to improve our lobbying laws. This admittedly modest proposal uh, to close an egregious loophole is one that I would ask you to, to incorporate to lift the veil of secrecy. Uh, I believe that it will help restore public trust in the Congress, one that uh, we must be able to follow the money trail and see where it leads. And this is a proposal that will ensure that the public knows the link between lobbyists and who's really paying their bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. Mr. Kirk? Thank you, Chairwoman Cavado and Ms. Slaughter. I just want to commend you on your work on, Ms. Ms. Slaughter, work on uh, insider trading by congressional staff. I support you on that. Uh, I am uh, testifying on behalf of um, the uh, provisions which would deny a pension to a member of Congress convicted of a felony. It uh, is the law of the land in my state. I think because it's on the Illinois statute books, it's the reason why the speaker included it in the underlying bill uh, that we're going forward with. Uh, the underlying bill uh, is uh, originally based on work of my predecessor in office, John Porter, who enacted the Illinois reforms in the mid-1970s, uh, introduced uh, the first pension forfeiture uh, 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 bills in the Congress in the early 90s. And the bill that I introduced uh, followed a heritage of uh, Congressman Randy Tate, uh, who introduced legislation to deny a pension to a member of Congress in 1996, 
which passed overwhelmingly 391 to 32 uh, in the Congress. Uh, the minority leader uh, voted for that legislation, uh, the speaker voted for that legislation, the, the majority leader voted for that legislation. The difference between the legislation that overwhelmingly passed the Congress in 1996 and the bill that I introduced and the current uh, proposal before the committee is the current proposal only would deny a pension to a member of Congress for three crimes, for bribery, uh, for uh, officers and members acting as a foreign agent, and for conspiracy to defraud the United States. In the original legislation, in the legislation I introduced, there were 18 other crimes for which a member would lose their uh, pension. Uh, the crimes that were omitted from the underlying bill are uh, false reporting of a salary, lying to a court, uh, violating the revolving door provisions uh, of, uh, of our um, uh, House rules, conspiracy to defraud the government, making false claims, buying votes, uh, making promises of employment, uh, fundraising with government resources, uh, intimidation uh, to fundraise, uh, soliciting in a public building, uh, hiding money, property, or public records, uh, making false statements to federal officials, fraud, wire fraud, supporting a juror, interfering with uh, commerce using threats, uh, travel to aid racketeering, and finally, old-fashioned tax evasion. Uh, what I would propose is an amendment to reload those 18 offenses uh, into the basic statute to conform it with the legislation that already overwhelmingly passed the Congress on a bipartisan vote in 1996. I think that it's not only good policy, it would be a good vote for members to take. I yield back. Well, I thank the members of the panel for your varying ideas and for bringing them before the panel. Uh, I think uh, we're demonstrating our, our, our bipartisan approach and that I think we're trying to be as open-minded as we possibly can, all of us. I'm not just saying our committee. And hopefully we can move forward like that. I have no questions. Uh, Ms. Slaughter, do you have any questions? Just a statement, basically. Uh, I thank all of you for, obviously, the hard work you've put into this. Uh, and Mr. Kirk, I thank you for, for your comments about the insider <coughs> trading. We discovered there is a, uh, a whole different group of lobbyists out there who work for traders whose only uh, job is to ferret information, insider information, from members and staff, and it's worth several million dollars, and they register nowhere. Uh, and we, we uh, I'm, this bill, I think, is very important, and we hope that there will be a lot of support. And I just register a bit of disappointment. I think I feel that we were more intent on doing something important here today if we had not just gone downstairs and voted against putting Jack Abramoff before the Ethics Committee, what he has done here, and to do an investigation. Um, seven members, I think, abstained from uh, just voted present. Uh, five or six Republicans voted yes. The rest, that was party line vote. Uh, that would have been such a graphic demonstration that what we're doing here today had some teeth and that we really mean it. And I just want to register my disappointment uh, that, that we could not have done better by that. Uh, but thank you all for your work, uh, and I, uh, I, I think we still got a long way to go. This is what we do with this round. I think it's just the first. But thank you for your very thoughtful work. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, this uh, might be the final panel. I'm not as, at all certain. Sh um, Congresswoman Schmidt, Baird, Bean, and Emanuel. I don't, he was here. While you all are getting settled, I'm going to take the opportunity to make a statement in reaction to uh, Mrs. Slaughter's statement. I, I don't think that uh, anything that we've uh, done here today has been diminished at all by any vote we take on the floor. I think we're taking seriously our responsibility to look at our own house, clean it up, and make the revisions and, the, uh, and, and an honest attempt to uh, reflect the deep devotion that we have to a house that we want our constituents to hold in high esteem. So I would like to say that I'm starting in the middle with Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee for holding this hearing on lobbying reform and permitting me to testify before you today. Uh, I commend you for your work on H.R. 4975, the Lobbying Accountability and Transparency Act, and expeditiously moving this legislation forward. For a little bit of trivia pursuit, 
You may not be aware that lobbying actually got its start in my home county, Claremont County, Ohio. Not the actual pursuing of policymakers itself, but the term lobbying. Claremont County's favorite son, Ulysses S. Grant, coined the term on one of his trips between the Willard Hotel and the White House. A crowd would gather in the lobby of the Willard waiting for Grant to pass through so that they might have a minute to discuss their favorite issues with him. He called them lobbyists. I believe the opportunity to petition our government is an important part of the democratic process, so important that it was included in the First Amendment. But recent events underscore the need for reform. And I want to suggest two provisions as you consider a legislative response. To regain the trust of the American people and to give them confidence in their government again, we must create additional transparency and accountability. One way to do that is by permitting people to gain additional information about the legislative process. A step toward that goal would be to make filings of the Foreign Agents Registration Act, the FARA Act, available on the Internet. I've introduced legislation, H.R. 4679, FARA Sunshine Act, to require just that. According to the National Journal, some of the biggest clients of lobbyists are foreign corporations and foreign governments, providing major sources of revenue, sometimes totaling millions of dollars. As you know, FARA requires foreign agents to, number one, register with the Department of Justice if they engage in political activity or represent a foreign principal before the U.S. government, and two, disclose their agreements with income from and expenditures on behalf of the foreign entities. Currently, the Department of Justice allows the public to view FARA filings in a small DOJ satellite office in downtown Washington, D.C. To be admitted to the office, one must sign in, present identification, and undergo security screening. It's inconvenient, and one could also call it cumbersome. We should be encouraging accountability and transparency and to make the FARA documents available on the Internet. I mean, quite frankly, the folks in my district aren't going to come to Washington, D.C. to ferret out this kind of information. But the folks in my district and every district across this United States deserve the same opportunity as the people living in Washington, D.C., to have easy access to, these, to this information. <coughs> I want to thank you for including in the bill the requirement that lobby of the the requirement that Lobbying Disclosure Act, the LDA filings, be available on the Internet. In, recent, in a recent article in the National Journal, Professor James Thurber, director of the American University Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies, estimates that more than 100,000 people in Washington are lobbyists or associated with the business of lobbying. Thurber says that ultimately the number is not as important as knowing who is lobbying what they are lobbying for, and how much money they are spending. By putting the LDA filings on the Internet, we will increase transparency and disclosure and allow the public to make its own judgment. Finally, recent pre-recorded mass telephone call campaigns have been going across the country, including my congressional district, and have violated transparency, disclosure, accountability that we expect. These campaigns have flooded our constituents with calls and misidentified sponsors. Call campaigns to my district even forged the caller identification number to make it appear that my own congressional district office was making those calls. We all strongly support the First Amendment right to free speech, but, it is, too, but is it too much to ask that the callers truthfully identify who they are and just where those calls are coming from? I introduced legislation, H.R. 4180, the Identification and Disclosure Act, which would require pre-recorded telephone calls to, number one, disclose at the beginning of the call the person paying for the call, full name and legal address, and two, disclose the accurate caller identification number of the person paying for that call, not a telemarketer's number. I understand that the House may consider 527 reform in a separate bill and I ask that you consider including this provision. Again, Madam Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Bean? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, 
Yeah, could you hit your, um, yeah, thank you. And I want to thank the committee uh, for holding this hearing today in such an open and inclusive manner in the interest of uh, openness and transparency. Americans across the nation have been hearing about the need for lobbying reform. Unfortunately, they're suspicious of our commitment to enact real reforms, a byproduct of past excesses, still unfolding scandals, a complacent acceptance of the status quo, and our slow response to act. I'm encouraged that this committee has invited us here to this today to discuss reform proposals that I hope the House can come together on across partisan lines to shed more daylight on how we conduct business and take action to prevent abuses of the legislative process in the future. I believe the most important responsibility we have as representatives is to keep our constituents informed of how and why we make the decisions we do in Washington. It's my sincere wish that our chamber institute real changes that will provide the transparency that should be expected of the United States Congress. First, I want to speak to the idea of earmark reform. I believe members should continue to have the ability to request federal funds through priority projects for worthy, in worthy initiatives in their districts. We each understand the unique needs, challenges, and opportunities of our districts better than other members, and we should be able to present the case for our requests on their merits. However, the current earmarking process is designed circumvents public scrutiny by including member requests in conference reports. Every year, questionable projects are found in these reports, sometimes inserted in the dead of night, which call into question the dedication of this body to spending tax dollars responsibly and with accountability. For this reason, I'm supporting Congressman Flake's proposal to move member projects out of report language and into legislative text debated on the floor. I would hope we all can agree that projects worth funding are worth debating. This proposal moves us one step closer toward greater transparency in government, but we aren't doing enough to inform the American people about the votes that we cast in Congress. The Library of Congress's Thomas website is a valuable tool for civic participation, but constituents cannot easily find or understand their representatives' voting records. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, accountability is a word we frequently use to those we govern, but sometimes fail to apply to ourselves. Toward that end, we should all provide our constituents an easily accessible resource for tracking our votes. I plan to introduce a resolution which would require the House Clerk to maintain complete voting records organized by member. This information would be and should be linked directly to each of our publicly funded official websites so that our constituents can easily find out how we've voted. With the click of a button, anyone with access to the internet would be able to view a comprehensive list of every vote taken during a Congress and see a description of each vote and when possible an estimated cost of that legislation. The more information and greater transparency for the American people can only serve to strengthen American democracy, improve the accountability of this body, and reduce the potential for abuses in the future. Thank you again for the opportunity to address the committee. Thank you, Mrs. Bain. Mr. Baird. I thank the gentlelady and uh, colleagues. I'd like to address two provisions, uh, and I think they're both common sense and reasonable, and I hope the committee will look favorably on them. The first one actually uh, addresses an issue raised by many prior speakers before you today, and that has to do with the inadequate time members are given to read legislation. Under current House rules, uh, under normal procedures, bills have to lay over for three days. However, the first order of business is often a martial law rule waiving the three-day provision. I've introduced legislation providing for a mandatory 72-hour requirement for members of Congress to read legislation. It, this could be waived by a supermajority vote in the event of a national emergency. It would also uh, continue in the later days of the Congress. As you know, uh, automatically right now the three-day rule is waived in the, last, the waning days of the Congress. Why is this important? Because critical legislation over the past few years has come up increasingly in the middle of the night with less than, really less than 12 hours often to read it, often less than 24. The Medicare bill is a case in point. Last year we passed a, the defense appropriation bill. $453 billion worth of spending, we had five hours to read it. When I tell constituents back home that we're reading thousands of pages of legislation, spending hundreds of billions of dollars of their taxpayer money, and no one has had a chance to read it, they are shocked. Interestingly enough, uh, I began to work on this several years ago, and in the course of preparing the legislation, 
came across an interesting discovery. The chair of this committee, uh, Mr. Dreyer, was part in 1993 of a Republican group called the Committee on Deliberative Democracy. And they said, in quotes, a bill that can not, cannot withstand three days of scrutiny is a bill that should not be enacted into law. Now, routinely, this very committee and the chairman violate that rule, and the majority of Republicans violate that rule. Apparently, back in 1993, when they said if it can't withstand three days of scrutiny, what they really meant was three hours should be sufficient. I don't find it sufficient. I would like this body to move forward and make a mandatory 72-hour rule. I would also note that there is a website that has been created to support this. It's called readthebill.org, and already we are receiving support from all sides of the political spectrum, the left, the right, the center, and the concept has been endorsed by groups such as Families USA and the American Library Association. One other element of this I'm particularly proud of, and that is that not only would members of Congress have 72 hours to read legislation, the public would as well. According to the provisions I've proposed, online text searchable formats would be required to be available to the public on the internet for 72 hours before a congressional vote. So that if pharmacists or seniors or hospitals are to be impacted by a Medicare provision, they can read about that provision before we've, we have to vote on it. So too, if, uh, if schools are gonna be affected by no child left behind, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The point being this, Jefferson could not have envisioned the ad advent of the internet, but I'm confident that if he had, he would support this provision. And I, I would just ask rhetorically, if people don't support this and don't see fit to include it, I'll be very interested in how folks explain that to their constituents. How do you go back home and say, I don't believe members of Congress should have at least 72 hours to read legislation before voting on it? And how do you go back home and tell your constituents, and I don't think you should have a right to see the legislation that's going to affect your life before Congress votes on it? The second provision I will raise, I'm proud to have introduced along with uh, the ranking Democrat on this committee, Ms. Slaughter. And uh, I, I would preface this by noting, I appreciate the gentlelady's comments earlier that you've tried to approach this uh, with an open mind. In this particular case, I would dis dispute that assertion, and I I'm sorry that it's the case. What I'm, we're proposing here is a provision to prevent insider trading by members of Congress, their staff, or families, or to prevent members of Congress and their staff or families from exchanging information with organizations that would engage in pro uh, activities that are tantamount to insider trading. Now, the reason I say that I'm disappointed in this committee and, uh, and dispute the assertion that it's been approached with an open mind is at least and I've been misquoted by the press before, so I'll give the benefit of the doubt. But yesterday in a press interview, I was told that the, the senior counsel for this very committee on the majority side had described this as a, a stunt, a political stunt, and said it is not necessary because it's already prohibited. With respect, it is not. That was a false statement. Let me be clear about this. Current House ethics rules do indeed suggest that members cannot profit from inside information. But ethics rules do not have the force of law, and they're not prosecutable. The rule in the general public is this. If you have information from inside a company and you trade on it, that's a crime. We all know about that. The Martha Stewart case made it quite well known. If you gain information from inside the Congress right now and seek to trade on it by trading commodities or stocks, that is not currently illegal, and it certainly should be. There are firms in this town called, um, oxymoronically perhaps, political intelligent firms. Now, political intelligence firms are designed, their purpose is to gather information for, the, for, in part, for making investment decisions. Insofar as the information they obtain is public, I have no problem with that. If it's a committee report, testimony before a committee, that's fine. But when they gather information that is not yet public, and stock trades or commodity trades are made on that, literally billions of dollars can be made without any opportunity for the public to know why. That's wrong and it should be corrected. Here's what our bill does. It specifically draws a bright line and says that members of Congress have to make, if they don't have their money in a mutual fund or a blind trust, they have to report within 30 days of making a major trade. Now that's in contrast to the year later time frame that we currently have to do. Secondly, it pro prohibits members of Congress and their families or top staff from making trades based on information that is not yet public. Third, it requires that, if, that you cannot exchange information with a person knowing they might use that information to make a trade if it's not yet public. And on the reverse side, you cannot make a trade if you received information and you know that it was not yet public. This is not currently prohibited. I want to underscore that. We have talked to, we asked the Ethics Council for an opinion and have yet to get a verdict on this, but we've also asked the SEC and it is our understanding that it is not yet prohibited. Now that's simply wrong. 
And I have to say I'm deeply frustrated that this committee, top staff, and apparently one of the leaders of this committee, suggested that this is a political stunt. It is far from a political stunt. It is about fairness, it is about justice, and it is about restoring faith in the American public in this institution. When we serve here, we should serve here to further the good of the country as a whole, not our stock portfolio or those of support, uh, supporters. I would finally conclude with this. If people don't support this legislation, I would ask, is there a reason for not supporting it? Is it possible that an individual or their party or their political supporters are in fact already benefiting from political inside information, and is that not being aided and abetted by the lack of opportunity to read legislation and by votes in the middle of the night? So I would urge this committee to take this quite seriously. I hope you'll pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Emanuel. Thank you very much. Having introduced, can you hear? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, having introduced, yeah. <laughs> is there a question from that side? Oh, great. Uh, um, having introduced lobbying reform leg in legislation comprehensive with uh, both Senator Feingold and Congressman Marty Meehan back in May, before it seemed to become vogue to have uh, lobbying reform legislation, I was approaching what I believe is an institutional problem that requires an institutional solution. It doesn't have a partisan or political stripe. And in the same way that my colleague uh, spoke, I support that legislation, the notion here of what we're supposed to do, the information you're talking about is about making sure that the public have a sense of what we're doing here. Now, about six years ago, we altered the relationship between contributors and candidates with campaign finance reform. It is time we alter the relationship between lobbyists and legislators. It's been over 10 years since we've ever dealt with that. And any attempt to deal with that has to be comprehensive. I believe that in a time in which one member has already pled guilty and three others are under serious judicial review, that this Congress needs to tell the American people that we're serious about the people's business. Now, there is a cost, in my view, to this corruption. And the people pay for it. We have our differences about the policy on Medicare, prescription drug bill, on the corporate tax bill, or the energy bill. But when you look at the relationship between what has happened with that legislation, contribution, gifts, and special favors, there's a clear cost to the American people for this corruption. Now, I don't think, and what Marty, uh, Congressman Meehan and I, and Senator Feingold on the Senate side introduced was comprehensive reform. It dealt with both enhancing disclosures, curbing privately funded travel, the revolving door, as well as uh, putting real teeth into enforcement. There are different pieces of it. But it also dealt with both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue. Because the truth is, if you look over the last year and uh, some of the stories, what has happened both at the Interior Department with one official, uh, high-ranking official at OMB in the executive branch, who's now under judicial review, that this is a problem that does not just exist for the legislative branch, but also deals with the executive branch. And you must comprehensively reform all pieces of it. I think the Senate missed an opportunity yesterday with no real reform. And I don't think it's a mistake that Senator McCain opposed it, Senator Obama opposed it, Senator Feingold opposed it, three individuals who led a fight and a career on reforming the political system. Now, the question will be, will the House follow in that path and take a swing and a miss or deal with comprehensive reform? Uh, and so I submit as an amendment uh, what Congressman Meehan and I introduced back in May as a comprehensive approach to reform dealing with all the aspects, tougher transparency, tougher enforcement, a revolving door that makes sure when you're negotiating a prescription drug bill, you're not negotiating with the pharmaceutical industry, and ensuring that the trips that we take are, whether they're for the public interest or privately funded, they're fully uh, notified and everybody uh, knows what's going on. That is, in my view, the only way to deal with the lobbying community and the relationship between lobbyists and legislators. In the one last thing I would like to add, um, in the last year of 2005, the entire money spent by lobbyists was $3 billion to influence members of Congress. Half of all retiring members become lobbyists. Incremental approach to this problem is not sufficient. And so I submit our legislation as an attempt to deal with it from a comprehensive uh, way and to ensure that those who spend their careers on this, watching this issue, don't say that the House did the same thing that the Senate did. Thank you. 
I uh, thank you all for your testimony, and I do have a couple questions, if you wouldn't mind sitting for. F I, I missed exactly what you said because I, I apologize. So don't. Um, it was not. Is riveting. your is the revolving door proposal that you have is to shut the the door down completely or to make it two years, three years? Two or? years, both so, leg legislative and executive branch. And in this and bill, the, it's a one year provision. Right, and it also deals with notifying when discussions start. Okay. Okay. I which, would I, like, which I think is a, and I don't mean to interrupt, but no. I think is it, beyond the two-year moratorium. Mm -hmm. uh, it all it also deals with the notification, so uh, I think it is publicly uh, aware that you are negotiating or at some point entering into discussions about a job. I think as you look at the last year's stories, I think it's relevant to when people are seeking outside employment to the work they're doing on the floor, to the matters before the floor committee. Okay. Before. Thank you. I would like to say just as a way as a comment, and then I'll get to my question. Uh, we, everybody talked about transparency, and I know we always try to invent names for our bills that sound very catchy, and, but I would like to point out that the name of the bill that, that has been put forth and is being worked on or worked through this committee process is the Lobbying Accountability and Transparency Act. I think we all recognize that in this day and age of fast tools of disclosure that we need to use what we have availability, and both of you all brought that out. I think very well. In terms of defending um, Mr. Dreyer's opinion in 1993 and his opinions uh, now, I'll have to leave that to him. Uh, and I thought it was very interesting that, that you could speak for Mr. Jefferson. I wish I could speak for Mr. Jefferson as well. But um, I would like to ask a question on the insider training uh, by staff because it's been, I want to read you this part of the statute and see how you think what this says differs from what you're proposing. Are you reading from statute or house ethics, if I may? I am reading from uh, the rules of the House. That's, is that not different than statute? Code of Official Conduct. Okay. Okay. Have you, are you familiar with this? Yes. Okay. I'll read it. Uh, a member, delegate, resident, commissioner, officer, or employer of the House may not receive compensation and may not permit compensation to accrue to his beneficial, his or her, beneficial uh, interest from any source, the receipt of which would occur by virtue of influence improperly exerted from his position in Congress. And then I want to ask another question, too, and then you can respond. Um, insider trading is illegal in this country. I mean, we've, we've seen, obviously, you pointed to the most famous case most recently. What, and maybe I didn't catch the distinction between what you're saying is getting insider information, because what would be the difference between getting, if I was in my office and a, a publicly traded company came into my office and, and told me something and I acted on it or my staff member who was there acted on it. Why is that not illegal now? I believe that is illegal now. You're mistaken, as a matter of fact. If information is obtained from inside a company, you're, you're legitimate in this point. If you get information from inside a company and you make trades based on information coming from inside the company, that is illegal. If someone gets information based on information coming from inside the Congress, that is not currently illegal. That's what my bill does, and that's why it is not a stunt. And I would suggest to the gentlelady, unless I'm mistaken, that I do not believe that stat the uh, reference you cited has the force of law. It refers to internal house ethics, but it is not statutory language with the external force of law with criminal and civil penalties associated with it, unless I'm mistaken. Now, let me further, if I may, you mentioned the gentlelady mentioned transparency. Another element of our bill requires the disclosure of who the firm's clients are for these political intel firms. If you're a lobbyist on Capitol Hill, you have to file forms that disclose who your lobbyists are or who your clients are. If you're part of a political intel firm, you do not have to file that, and you should. The reason the gentlelady asked the question, why is it not illegal? We asked the Ethics Committee this. We asked the SEC this. Because one of the standard criteria, and I don't pretend to be an expert on this, but we have consulted with experts, it is ambiguous as to whether or not there is a duty of confidentiality extant between members of Congress and members of the public when we, or, or our staff and the public when we debate in, or discuss information in the process of formulating laws. We understand that it is perfectly necessary for members of Congress and their staff to engage in dialogue in the course of developing legislation. We want to make sure that we don't inadvertently do something stupid, which we do plenty of times here. But we want to try to avoid it. So we have to consult with people. But when you do that, what happens to confidentiality? Now, that is different. If you have information from inside a company, you know there's going to be a merger or a takeover, major product announcement. That is closed within the company. 
And you have a duty. In fact, people sign forms as part of their conditions of employment. These are very standard in the industry. And you can't divulge that to someone who then makes a trade. That does not exist currently for the Congress unless the council would tell me that it does. If so, then I'll stand corrected. My best understanding, consultation with the SEC, with House Ethics and others, that does not currently exist. Now, if you think it's acceptable that members of Congress and their staff can, with impunity, give information to someone who then makes a stock or commodity trade and makes millions of dollars before the public has access to the information, then I'll also stand corrected. But I'll tell you, the public does not see it that way. And average investors don't think that somebody inside D.C. should be able to make trades before they have public information. Well, I think to a person we would all reject that as a notion, that we would accept that as acceptable behavior. Uh, then we'll that, pass my, re my resolution. I'll, I'll be I'm just trying to get to information on your piece of legislation sure. here and get the distinctions between existing law and what we're working on. And, and that's, that's the point I'm making. All right. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Uh, well, I, I thank the gentlelady for yielding. And um, I apologize for not being here. Um, I had a group of, from my district that just came in, and I had to see them. So uh, but let, let, let me just uh, say that I, I'm, I'm familiar with the amendments that you've offered. And, uh, and I hope, um, I think there's some good ideas here. And I hope, in fact, you have the opportunity on the House floor uh, to, be able to, um, to be able to pursue them. Um, you know, I've been saying all throughout the series of hearings that we've had that um, I think we have to approach this issue of lobbying reform, reform and cleaning up this house from two perspectives. One is the issue of transparency and accountability and making sure that uh, we have the right laws in place. Um, but the second thing is that I think we have to clean up our own house here uh, because a lot of the abuses that have occurred have occurred kind of behind closed doors, you know, in a secretive process and a flawed process. You know, members should have opportunities to read bills. Members should have an opportunity to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, know who is putting what in the bill. Uh, and, um, and I think if, if we did that as well, I think that would clear up uh, a lot of the, the problems that we're now, we're now faced with. So uh, uh, I think that uh, what would be a really great gesture, I think, on behalf of the leadership of this House, on behalf of the Rules Committee, is if this bill were to come to the floor under an open process to allow everybody here to be able to have their say, debate their amendments, and let, member, let, let, let the 435 of us vote up or down as to whether or not they're good ideas or bad ideas. Um, I think this issue is that important. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleading for an open process uh, uh, and, uh, you know, not just cherry picking individual ideas. I think everybody has a good idea. No one would be up here waiting all this time to testify if you didn't think you had a good idea. So I yield to the gentleman from. I appreciate that. I, I just wanted to add one other element. Uh, First of all, I still would maintain that the House ethics rules are different than statutory language. But I would also add this. Let's assume that the House ethics rules are just on this notion of members trading themselves. Set aside, to my knowledge, House ethics do not deal with this issue of sharing information with, with uh, political intel or lobbyists. But let's deal with just internally. I would ask the gentlelady and members of this committee, what body within this House currently monitors the trading activity of members of Congress to see if there are, or, and their staff and families to see if there are correlations between legislative activities or not? I'm quite well versed, I'm quite well aware of people who have investments in a host of, of various uh, uh, equities that they vote on reliably. Now, they may or may not be seeking to feather their nest, but I would venture, I would, uh, perhaps someone can enlighten me, has there ever been in the last two or three decades a case in which a member of Congress was sanctioned for making trades based on information they obtained in the course of their duties? Now, we have seen, we have a member of Congress going to jail. We have another one, uh, a lobbyist, just confessed he's going to go to, or, and is heading for jail, we just learned. This is a town where people take advantage of loopholes. We deal with billions of dollars here on a reliable basis. And if something's not got a bright line saying it's illegal, somebody has probably found a way to take advantage of it. And what I'm trying to say is close that, close that open door. Well, let me just, I, I think you have a very good point. I, one of the things, and I'm not saying you're suggest, suggesting this, but one of the things I, I think we also need to be careful of here is that, uh, you know, not everybody is involved in bad things. There are, we have some pretty good members of Congress up here who, you know, do the right thing on both, on both sides of the aisle. What you don't want to do is create a system where um, you have this, you have all this policing about in people's personal business 
you know, to make it even less attractive for anybody to want to come down here and serve. I mean, you know, serving, you know, it's a privilege to serve here, but it shouldn't be punitive either. I mean, and, and uh, members shouldn't have to feel like they're, you know, uh, you, that they're constantly having somebody investigating, you know, every financial transaction they make. But uh, if, yeah. if I yeah, may, sure. uh, in the general public, I'm familiar with the gentleman who right. manages a private mutual fund. Right. He reports to me that he has to report within 48 hours of making a trade. Right. Now, we're not asking for 48 hours. We're just asking for right. 30 I days. I hear. And you can avoid that if you want to put your money in mutual funds or right. in a blind trust. You don't have to report a trade under our bill. And you don't have to report minor trades. If you ch trade over $1,000, then you have 30 days to report so that someone can look and say, isn't it interesting the congressman or Senator X was involved in the pharmacy in the uh, Medicare legislation, right. and they traded pharmaceutical stocks or energy. You get the picture. Right. No, I now, I don't see that as too onerous. If members of the general public have to do this, no, why I, should members of Congress right. be exempt? No, when I, we stand, and I don't disagree with you. And I, I um, and it, it doesn't impact me. I'm broke, so I, don't, <laughs> I mean, I don't have any money to invest. So, but I, I appreciate uh, the, the gentleman. I certainly support what he's trying to do. Thank you, Mr. Gangri. Do you have any questions? Uh, uh, Madam Chairman, thank you. I, uh, I think the the uh, amendment that uh, the gentleman, uh, uh, Mr. Baird, I didn't hear the other other testimony, but uh, uh, I think it's a it's a good amendment. And I don't, of course, I don't know whether it will be part of this uh, of this bill or not, and this, if it will be made uh, uh, in order. I'm not the last word on that, uh, but I I think the the stock act, uh, as the acronym says, is uh, is 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 a good is a good uh, piece of legislation, and I would uh, commit to. Uh, uh, supporting it if it comes forward. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your all's patience. I appreciate you bringing some innovative ideas before the committee, and I look forward to, as I've said to the other panels and to the other members of the committee, I look forward to uh, a good, solid lobbying reform package, and I thank you both. I thank all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five days to submit statements for the record. Any other business before the committee? The committee's adjourned. In a moment, the French Prime Minister talks about recent protests against new labor laws.